This episode of Street Food Journeys features Donald and Lily's Nyonya Restaurant, the Baba and Nyonya Museum, Sate Chelop by Debbie Teo, the Jet Lag Warriors, Malacca's Historical Sites with Shao Kani Abbas, Mi Bodo, Coconut Shake by yours truly, and I asked two of our Masters of Malaysian Cuisine chefs about what dishes they think of when they think of Malacca. Stay tuned to find out their answers. So why Malacca? Malacca is really kind of where it all started with Malaysia and its history. I remember growing up and studying in school about the, you know, the prince, uh, Prince Parameswara from India who founded Malacca. We learned about Princess Hang Li Pe from China, who came to Malacca with her entourage of 500 ladies in waiting to marry the Sultan of Malacca. We learned about the uh, the warriors Hang Tua, Hang Jebat, and all their friends. We learned about the Portuguese invasion, the Dutch and the British. Um, but it all actually started in Malacca. The Donald and Lily Nyonya restaurant is famous in Malacca, but it had very humble beginnings. It used to be a hawker stall. In 2013, the restaurant gained international recognition when it was named among the top 20 in the World Street Food Masters Award for the year. Today, their daughter, Jennifer, proudly continues the legacy as she serves customers who come for favorites such as Nyonya Laksa, Misiam, Nasi Ketuk, and Chendol. So Jen, I just like to find out yeah. how Donna and Lily came about, how it all started. Okay, um, back in the early seventies, my parents uh, actually started selling in front of the house, the veranda house at the Heritage Sheeran Street area, and then uh, my parents started push cart in the early seventies also. This is so the only picture of the push cart where okay. they sell uh, their specialty Nyonya Laksa, Misiam, we have Nasi Lemak and everything else lah. Mm. Okay, these are the pictures of them, the only pictures of them. We also sell uh, Chakwe Tiao and everything, all uh, mainly like street food, hawker, hawker street food. Okay, okay. Right? Yeah. And then uh, in the early 90s, okay. uh, we went back home to open and in the 2000, we came here in upscale, uh, selling hawker food in uh, upscale kopitiam like this, lah, a cafe. Yeah. When your father had the push cart, did he move around? Uh, yes, he was moving around. Yeah. In fact, like daytime, he sell uh, laksa and misiam. And the evening, he sells those uh, steamed peanuts and also uh, corn. Also, okay, right. so he was moving around. Yeah, so that means he did not just sell one item, uh, like yeah. That's why right, he sells yeah. several items to make ends meet, lah. Okay. Because back then we were very very poor. Also. Okay, and right. uh, just to show you, these are the items that uh, we all use for the laksa, which is fresh ingredients, curry okay. uh, powder involved. Right. Okay. During those days, uh, my parents, of course, we have to use this. Uh, Head meal. Head meal, correct. Right. Head yeah. meal. We call batu giling, sorry. Right. I lost for words, yeah? Yep. In those days, either that we use the pestle and mortar. Okay. To Very so tedious blend, job. Yeah, right. So called blend these items yeah, okay. and make it into a paste and we cook the paste for at least 8 hours on the walk. Can you tell the audience what are the items you use, please? Okay. okay. These are fresh lemongrass. Okay. Okay, dried chilies. Right. Galangal. Shallots, garlic, the Malaysian cheese, blachan, and also fresh turmeric. Okay. okay, and these are all fresh, yeah? Yeah, all fresh.
The Baba and Nyonya Heritage Museum is located in Malacca, and it used to be at the house of a Baba back in the 1800s. His name was Chan Cheng Siu, and it was turned into a museum in 1985. We join a guided tour to get a glimpse of the interior of the house. Imagine 100 years ago, it would be very warm, right? To not have the fans or aircon, no electricity. Okay, so we have to rely solely on the natural resources, so they have to open up the roofs uh, to allow ventilation and also lighting. So you can see this area here is very bright. Yeah? And at the same time, when it rains, rain water would actually flow into the house through the area. I'm not joking. Yeah, you can see the floor is wet. Yeah, this morning it rained, it's not. Yeah. So when it rains, rain water will actually flow into the house. And then in the Chinese culture, water symbolizes wealth. Money. So imagine every time when he pays, huh? the owner will say, Oh, good omen. Yeah, I will have plenty of money going into the house. Yeah, which is a good sign. Yeah. But if you ask me whether it works or not, I'm quite confident that it works. I spent my growing up years from 1968 to 1985 residing in Jalan Ong Kim Wee and Bukit Burang, respectively in Malacca before moving to Kuala Lumpur to settle here for good. My mother was a school teacher at Bandahile English School and my paternal grandpa was also a teacher there that taught the Jawi language. Growing up, I was actively involved in competitive swimming. I would attend my trainings on a regular basis except Sundays from 4 to 6. After each training session, we would all Hawk a push cart that sells satay chalok owned by Yong Cheng, one of the swimmer's parents. That was how my fondness over satay chalok came about. To me, that was the cherry on top of each day as we got to enjoy the warm and delicious broth of satay chalok after a two-hour long and hard training session. The stall has now upgraded and is a now well-known shop called Restaurant Sat Capital Satay in Malacca Town. So I've got Debbie here with me, my good friend and a master's of Malaysian cuisine chef. You are, Debbie, you are an expert in Yonya cuisine, but you're also born and raised in Malacca, right? Yes, I am, Jackie. Can you tell us what satay chalop is? Hi, Jackie. Yeah, satay chalop is uh, about, you know, like a satay, but it's got a peanut a gravy that goes into the each stick, I would say. The normal satay peanut sauce is kind of uh, straightforward. Maybe just chilies, uh, onions, uh, turmeric, and some lemongrass and uh, galangal. But this one has got other spices added into it. Okay, sure. So here we are. We can see you making the satay chelo. Can you tell us what the ingredients are? The ingredients are shallots, garlic, uh, lemongrass, galangal, uh, fennel, the fennel and the coriander you need to pan fry it first to get extra fragrance, then turmeric, um, buakaras, candle nuts. The next thing, the most important ingredient are the peanuts. Okay, okay, sure. The um, You put some dried chilies in there, just like dried chilies that have been soaked in hot water sort of thing, is it? Yes, that's correct. Okay, okay. They have this Hainanese bread that goes along with the sauce because we being kids, right, we wouldn't be eating all those, like maybe they have the pork slices and whatever, not your, your prawns or your fish cake. I would like to dip my the bread with the sauce and having it with the cucumber. That's the best for me. So that's just the roasted peanuts that you got there? Yes, yes. Okay. And then grind them, uh, semi coarse, so that you have okay. some bite in it, not too fine. Yeah. Okay, sure. Mm. Oh, look, the oil is starting to separate. Everyone always talks about, like, you know, if people are wondering at home, every time they read a recipe, a Malaysian recipe where it says you fry till the oil separates, this is what they mean, right? Like, you can yes. see the oil start to seep out. So what what do you use for the broth? Uh, uh you can use you can chicken stock carcass or you can oh. just use uh chicken stock granules. All right, okay, sure, sure.
So add it in. So at the beginning, you notice that the broth is very light orange in color. As yeah. it goes along, it will turn darker in tone. Okay. What are the typical stuff that you would put on the skewers? The typical ones are the binked puffs, then the uh, crispy binked, that all those that you know, when once you get into the broth, it will plump up and soak the most of the sauce. Okay. So that's the palm sugar or jaggery and salt. Eggs, quills, eggs on skewers, um, chicken slices, uh, prawns, even sotong, uh, Jackie, the sotong. The, yeah, yeah, the sotong. The yeah, dry sotong. Of, yeah, the brown sotong as well as the fresh uh, white squid. Okay, sure, sure, cool. Mm. Okay. Now they've upgraded certain stall cells, things like uh, big large prawns or whatever, you know, that's expensive. But okay. during those days, it's just simple things that you can get from the market. Okay, sure. Unlike, unlike those times when we just dip everything into the same pot. <laughs> yeah, it might, it might be a bit difficult nowadays to get away with that, right? <laughs> yeah. So you see, uh, I'm putting the egg and then the bread. Oh, okay, okay. Then I just ladle some of the broth over to show you how it's being eaten. It's, oh, wow, that's great. That looks really interesting. <laughs> I'm going to have to try this. Yeah. So you eat it with the bread and the cucumber. It's really nice. Okay, okay, great. Well, thank you so much for this, Debbie. The Jet Lag Warriors are a full-time traveling couple from Canada. And when they landed in Malaysia last year, just at the turn of the pandemic, they ended up being stuck there for a whole year. As a result, they had a great time, but they also managed to shoot a lot of content in Malaysia. And we're going to check in with them on their take on satay chelok in Malacca. So? Um, it's not cold. <laughs> Quite hot. Uh, <laughs> of course. It's really good. This one is the one that we thought was bacon, but it's not. I think it's pork actually, but it's really good. How's the sauce? The sauce is really nice. It's a little bit different than normal satay sauce. It's a little bit more runny. Really? Uh -huh. Is it sweet, savory, still peanut, right? Peanut, a little bit spicy. I think it's more runny because they cooked it. So it got hot, it got warmed okay. up, it got a little bit more liquidy. Right. But it's nice, Ivana. It's, it's impossible not to like this. It's meat and peanut sauce. It's like, okay. it's good. It has to be good. What you got there, the beef? Uh, I think so, I think this is beef. Mm. This is a good meal, this is mm -hmm. good, man. I feel like the proper way to eat it is off the stick, like you like like you did. Yeah. I feel like the wrong way to eat it will be with the fork. That's right. Right. So I'm gonna eat it from here. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna grow. Shalkani Abbas is a multi-award winning tour guide who's based in Malacca. He's also a friend of mine and what he's been doing ever since the pandemic is to take people around Malacca virtually via Zoom. He joins us to show us a little bit of some of the sites in town. Okay, Shalkani, can you tell us what this building is? Okay, this is the Dutch Square in Malacca and uh, behind, in, front, in, in, the, in the frame that you can see, the Stead Heights, that is okay. the build, uh, building built by the Dutch when they were here way back in 1641. Okay, so that's called the Stead Heights. And I love how in Malacca, one of the most prominent things about it is that like the all, all these red buildings. Yeah, because uh, the British paid it red in 1911. Okay, and sure. uh, it's supposed to be white, but uh, the state government wanted it red, so the color of prosperity. Okay, sure, sure. And that's another thing you see a lot in Malacca, the, uh, those trishaws, they're very beautifully decorated. Yes, right. But this type of trishaw is uh, decorated because to attract the domestic tourism. Do you know yeah. how much a uh, trishaw costs to make? It's around 6,000 ringgit. Oh, wow. Yes. <laughs> Very expensive. Mm, but uh, it's quite popular with the locals. 
because sure. with the children, you like to move around with them in the in the city. Oh, cool. Yeah. Cool. Now, and I don't know if you remember this trip, Shalkani. I pulled it out from my archives, but you took me to eat me bodo. Yeah. <laughs> if you translate it in English, it's stupid me, stupid me, <laughs> stupid noodle, yeah. stupid noodle. Uh -huh. But uh, this is the most attractive uh, uh, restaurant uh, because of the noodle, because uh, this noodle is so simple that uh, it's so affordable. Uh, you can find the Chinese, the Indians, the Malay. They line up just to have a taste of this in the morning for breakfast. Now, how much does a plate of this cost? Well, around two to three ringgit. But uh, to be frank with you, it's not the noodle. It's the, it's the, the spicy chili paste, which make it uh, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Sure. And then to make it nicer, you put a bit of vinegar or soy sauce. Wow, the best in the world. Ah, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah. So this gentleman is the... The Mibo. owner. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's run by uh, brothers. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That. So you just put the noodles there with the uh, banquet, right? And then you just you put the sauce. So the sauce is made at home. You just okay. put the sauce there. You just put. in the uh, in the in the olden days, this noodle is served during the wedding ceremony. Oh, because right. there's a lot, there's a lot of people help to volunteer for the wedding, so the owner of the house will give something to eat. So they they fried this noodle. All oh, right, thing. just like something simple to keep them yeah, happy and uh, something to eat. Yeah, this is quite oh. quite interesting. And okay. uh, you, do you know that uh, people from all the way from the north of Malaysia and Singapore sometimes line up long queue. Just to eat this simple noodle, <laughs> and we call it stupid noodle because of the simplicity simplicity of the noodle. <laughs> Stupidly delicious. Yeah, you listen to that. Uh, yeah, so that's the picture of the mee bodo that we bought. Yeah, no, no. This is the ruins of uh, Saint Paul's Church, built by the Portuguese, used by the Dutch as a place of worship, but uh, the British use this as a place to store gunpowder. Yeah, this temple is Ching Hun Ting Temple, and this is the oldest functioning Chinese temple in Malaysia, built after 1700. Malacca is famous for its coconut shake, which is made with beautiful fresh coconut. But if you want a quick and easy way to do it and you don't have access to fresh coconut, this is how you would do it at home. Paul is our co-founder of Masters of Malaysian Cuisine and he has never been to Malaysia, never been on his radar. So he's going to be my foil in some of these segments. So Paul, um, in Malacca, in Malaysia, I've been to this place called Klabang uh, Coconut Shake and I'm going to show you how to do it in South Africa itself, all right? Until such time as when you can go to Malaysia and try the real thing. It's the, some coconut juice and here, I'm, I'm just cheating. I'm just using like canned coconut juice because even though we can get like a whole young coconut, it's not that easy to get. So I want to just make it easy for you. Can you get coconut juice in South Africa, Paul? Yeah, yeah, coconut juice isn't too hard to get. We actually get it in like pharmacy, grocery stores. Oh, okay. So, well, there you go. Yeah. yeah. The mm -hmm. um, now, in Malaysia though, like what I find that a lot of Westerners do. I'm putting some sugar. In. I know that you're anti-sugar, sugar, but yeah, I'm just adding <laughs> some sugar here. Um, but in Malaysia though, when we drink coconut juice, the highlight is the coconut meat. Okay. And this is coconut meat that I actually bought separately. I don't know if you're going to be able to find it. We can't but buy coconut I got this. meat, but we can get whole coconuts. So I don't know if that... Oh, uh... yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Make sure you get young whole coconut, not the old. Those, like, those are the green not... ones, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Sort of thing. But you want the meat, okay? So I'm just putting some vanilla ice cream in here. So it's just coconut meat, which I found in the freezer section of my Asian grocery store and some ice cream, vanilla ice cream, and some coconut juice and a little bit of sugar. And 
um, usually in Malaysia, they actually add a ton of ice in it. Okay, so it's basically like a like a shaved ice thing. But with this, because it's a little bit cold now this time of the year in Australia, and I don't necessarily like to drink something that's kind of like 90% ice sort of thing. I just decided to go without. Um, but yeah, just throw it in the blender. I will use the ice like any time of the year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, also, because I didn't have any ice available, so. <laughs> but this is cold because the juice is cold and the ice cream is cold and the coconut meat was actually just defrosted from a frozen state. So there you go. So that, that's all it is. And in Malaysia, they would also serve it with like a scoop of ice cream as well, right? And yeah, I know like obviously the, you know, it's better to eat it there, but in the meantime, you can kind of like get a, a, a feel for the vibe of it just by doing that yourself at home. The thing is, I can picture the fact that, you know, it's really simple, but the fact that it's super easy as well, like, you know, it's super easy, but flavorful. If that's the way I can describe it from just watching this. Yeah. So I'm definitely going to yeah. give it a try. This is one of the hawker stalls in Malacca, and this lady sells wantan mi. It's a... Wantan mi is famous in Malacca, right? Yes, uh, and this is part of the old part of Malacca, and the road here we are looking at, we call it the Street of Harmony, because the four, the three world religions are all along this road here. This is the oldest Hindu temple in, Malacca, in Malaysia, built after 1700. And uh, it's very beautiful. The architecture is old architecture. And this is the replica of the Sultan of Malacca because we don't have any more the, the, the palace. So the, we built a replica to show that this is how the palace looked like a long time ago. But now it's a museum. I asked two of my masters of Malaysian cuisine chefs, Bob Artnan and Debbie Teo, both of whom were born and raised in Malacca, what food they think of when they think of Malacca. So, I think Malacca very popular in terms of dishes of uh, asam pedas. So, why I said asam pedas? Asam pedas is world famous, uh, uh, well known as asam pedas, is asam pedas ayam, or as chicken asam pedas. But now, uh, they improvise with the fish, with beef, or with oxtail. But for me, from Malacca, uh, people are uh, coming from uh, IC04 uh, that I love to do asam pedas uh, echo or we can oxtail asam pedas. So, Malacca is famous with asam pedas. Hi, Jackie and everyone. When going to Malacca, the must-haves are satay celok, wantan mi, asam pedas, chicken rice balls, nyonya laksa lemak, cendol, ice kacang, coconut shake, hukiao, a different type of noodle with a lot of fish cakes, laksa nyonya, did I mention that? Nyonya food and not forgetting the kuih karia, which is made uh, with uh, gula melaka. These are a few of the must-haves that you have to try whenever you're in Melaka. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Street Food Journeys Malaysia. Now, if you want all our bonus Malacca content, including the videos that we couldn't fit into this and the recipes as well, make sure you sign up, okay? And I'll see you back here next week for Johor. I'm Jackie and have a great week ahead.
this episode of Street Food Journeys features Chef Datu Ismail making laksa johol, the Jet Lag Warriors, Club Alami's Sea Warriors Market, Marco D, award winning tour guide Shaukani Abbas, Me Rebels by Yours Truly, Chef Rene Jufri, Chef Dave Murugaya, and Chef Bob Adlin. I ask MOMC at Heart's Chef Dato Ismail Ahmad, Tourism Malaysia Ambassador for Culinary, what dish he thinks of when he thinks of Johor. Okay, if I think of Johor food, obviously, first thing in my mind is Laksa Johor. It's my most favourite. Try it. Together with me here is Chef Raja, been working in Johor for the past 20 over years. So she going to assist me, or rather I assist her, to cook this special me uh, laksa johor. We do call it me laksa johor. Special about laksa johor, we use spaghetti. We use spaghetti instead of egg noodle. Okay, this is already bought spaghetti. Okay, to prepare uh, laksa johor uh, masala powder. You need coriander seed, anise, cumin, nutmeg, and chili powder, a little bit. Yeah, you roast it and then you grind it into powder. Then you mix it with the chili powder. This is the the fish stock that we boil. These are the ingredients that we have grinded. All this are uh, dried shrimp, uh, fish fillet, and also uh, prawn. We, we blend it into uh, like a mousse here, yeah? Time for us to cook. Come, Raja. Okay, Chef Raja is going to show you how to massage this. First, you add in the chili, the dried chili paste. You have to fry the dried chili paste first. If you don't have the dried chili paste in your country, you can use chili powder or chili flake. Or chili powder is the best, okay? and you mix it with water then you fry this because I want to see the oil turn red yeah? and what is next? this is the onion uh, this is the candle nut, garlic, ginger, galanga, onion and lemongrass normally what I do is drain it yeah? I did it masak make sure you fry this nicely and fragrant yeah? laksa joho masala powder fish masala powder fragrantly nicely make it so nice and happy look at that mm. oh sedap okay once it boil nicely like making curry like this and then you add in the uh, this is the uh, fish fillet boiled fish fillet with fresh prawn yeah and dried prawn this is very very delicious okay and it got to be thick not too thin because Originally, Johorian eat it with fingers, can? But of course, nowadays they use fork and spoon. <laughs> and of course, knife sometimes. And when to serve laksa Johor, it is during festival. Yeah, and very rare you can get them if you go to Johor to eat laksa Johor. Because this is a very premium, premium item. Add in coconut cream and the curry seed all together. Just a little bit of salt. I want too much lah. Nah. Mm, so sedap. Okay, done. Now I'll show you how to assemble the laksa. Let's go inside the restaurant. Okay, see you there. There is some noises in the kitchen, so please forgive me. Okay, because we are busy preparing for Ramadan. So anyway, so this is the spaghetti that you already bought to, to al dante. Now you twist it nicely. This is how laksa Johu been served, okay? Normally, they serve it uh, in, uh, on the plate. See my stepmother there? Just say, bowl. Now, you pour in the gravy. Looks so good. Okay, this is the local basil, but you can use sweet basil, no problem, if you are in your country. Uh, long bean or French bean, no problem. Okay. Salted uh, loba, salted, uh, you can go to the ASEAN grocery, 
you can get salted lettuce. Chop it, yeah, fine. Yeah, sliced cucumber. Peel the skin and you julienne it nicely. Uh, Vietnamese basilic or daun kesum. Uh, onion ring. Okay. And here is bean sprout. Uh -huh. Alright, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for watching how to prepare laksa joho. Thank you Chef Raja for being uh, together in cooking and preparing this for me. Till then, see you. Happy eating. I'm Chef Ismail from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. The jet lag warriors had an opportunity to try laksa joho when they were in Malaysia. Now, Steve famously does not like the fish. So what do they think of the dish? Let's find out. Now, what would be my strategy? Oh, I should probably squish the lime. Let's do that. By the way, beautiful preparation by Ivana. Beautiful gift from our friend, and then Ivana arranges it beautifully on a plate here. So maybe do this, right? I mean, I have to assume. Yeah. I think you need to mix everything, I think. Mix everything? Yeah. With the hand? Yeah. Amazing. Okay, um, don't be shy. A little nervous how to mix with the hand. Do I do, I do a turn? Do I do a squish? Oh, no. I'm gonna go for maybe a... Maybe uh, should I grab it and spin the plate no, like a mixer? No, 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 no. no, no, no. Uh, Be a big boy. Okay, just mix like this. Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. Is it right to mix? Yeah, maybe. Ivana, it's too late. I've done it. Oh, look at this. It's too late, Ivana. I've done it. This is the Malaysian spaghetti. Uh, Malaysian spaghetti, and I can tell you right now, fish. That mix job stirred up some <laughs> wafting fumes. Okay, trying my best. Appreciate the gift, willing to try, willing to learn, spread the chili out. Oh man. Malaysia style. I mean, I'm just gonna shove it. I'm just gonna have to shove it in my mouth. Come on, shove it, shove it, shove it. Let me try to get an onion in there and some okay. celery and some of this pickled stuff. Here we go. Uh, it tastes good. I'm very thankful for the gift. I'm sure it's good. It's delicious. It's amazing. It's just not for me. I'm trying my best. Yeah. Look at it. Like. Like Which fish. is, I guess, like blended or like smashed up somehow. Yeah. Yeah. That fish flavor is not for me. I like both. I like both. This is also five stars. Boom! Most visitors to Malaysia are familiar with Pasar Malam or night markets, but we're going to visit Pasar Pendeka Laut which is a fish market where visitors, including tourists, can buy seafood directly from the fishermen. I talked to Serena Rahman a little bit more about it. Okay, Serena, um, this is the way to the Warung, is that correct? Yes, that's right. Okay. Now, who does the Warung serve? Like, do you ever get tourists into that area or is it just my local people? Yeah, we do a tourist because under Kavalami we have a tourism program. So they do come in through the jetty. This is where they get on the boats to do our tours. Um, but the people actually come in for the market, which you see on screen now. And what the Warung does is boost the sales at the market because we offer the food that is, you know, cooked based on the seafood that we sell. So what you see in the screen is the local community um, buying some of the food so that they can prepare some of the seafood so they can prepare the dishes for customers to eat. Um, and then if customers buy fish straight off the boat, you know, from our market, they can also cook it upstairs at the Waro and either take it home to eat or eat there. Oh, right. Very cool. The, um, so how long has this Waro been running for? Actually, the Warung only opened um, in June of 2020, um, but the, the market, the Pasa Pendekalaut, has been open since 2016. Oh. So, you know, we've been slowly working up towards trying to boost the sales, trying to tell people about the food that we have, trying to teach them about our sustainable fisheries, and then, you know, the value that they get from eating freshly caught seafood, chemical-free. Oh. The most most of the food that is served is seafood from below. Um, the idea also is to teach all these young people um, how to cook these these recipes. Um, when it's not COVID, uh, there are actually some local aunties who come in to cook as well, and so they teach the young people how to cook. Good,
susun ketam itu agar dia tak, tak, tak nampak dan resepi dari saya iaitu ketam sama telur Marco D is an Englishman based in Malaysia. He's a TV presenter, actor, and YouTube and TikTok star. He had the opportunity to travel to Johor a few years ago. He joins us along with MOMC's Dave Murugaya to talk about it. Now what I've noticed actually in a lot of these restaurants in Malaysia is they have these snacks before you eat. And in England we have nuts, we have crisps, we have chips, but in Malaysia it's fish. So easy. this is called uh, on suck or tuck and it's basically fish wrapped up in uh, this banana leaf and you know what really small really good really tasty great for a snack so today we're talking about Johor aren't we and uh, Dave I imagine you're from Johor yes exactly so I'm really curious from your point of view what you have experienced in Johor and you know like you know when did you went and which part of the Johor if you remember and some of the insight about it well when I went to Johor I didn't realize how big Johor was <laughs> I just knew like uh, JB Johor, Johor Baru okay. okay and then I went to all these little places all these night markets um, so many little restaurants that some of my friends from KL had never heard of that were just oh really nice i mean just all the seafood like the laksa the mee rebus, like there's there's just so many things right dave uh yeah basically like uh, johor laksa i believe it will be like a bit shock that we're eating with the spaghetti right what are the things that you really really like if give you a chance that you would like to like try it again well dave i tell you what i went there recently and check it out for yourself wow this is like a bread bread making places yeah so we went to this bread place um and it was crazy because it, it was it was so busy when we went there in the morning and people were queuing up uh just because it, it wasn't nice inside like the interior it mm -hmm. was just a really simple place that has been around for many years and i think okay. that's what i love about malaysia they have so many the heritage is so strong they have shops from ages ago and the bread there was just oh so many different types of bread yeah and it was just fresh when you walked in the shop you could just smell all the fresh breads um and there were so many weird breads that i would never have tried before um mm -hmm. like fish fish in a bread i think there was one called sardinia or something yeah yeah sa sa sardine bread right yeah it's quite popular in malaysia where they put sardine as, as a like a sandwich kind of thing in a bread for a, for a westerner sardines in bread sounds disgusting but when you yeah, try yeah, it, yeah. oh my gosh <laughs> wow yeah um and i went fishing so we actually um went to this prawn farm where okay. you could actually get your own prawns and you can cook them so that wow. was a really fun experience as you can okay. see i'm wearing the uh the jb football top as well there <laughs> okay cool what do you think about the johor seafood uh, because i personally because i come from a smaller like a small town in johor called Sagamat. so mm. there we are quite popular with our durian with our pomelo and yeah, yeah all those uh we call it kampong dishes so they're not really much uh, popular of uh, seafood because i think jb is nearest to the seaside and all that there's some small islands which yeah. might you know uh popular for the seafood and that that's quite strange because in malaysia you would expect places like sabah to have nice seafood because they're yeah. really close to the sea but in yeah. places like jb yeah, yeah. um the seafood is still really really good um yeah. and towards the end of the night um mm -hmm. i actually went to this place where they had so many different types of food um they had these night markets not just in jb in malaysia but mm -hmm. in jb i went to this one night market and everything's so cheap 
and it's yeah, so I mean, <laughs> I mean, that's the place for us to, you know, get all this. Even if you realize in night market, not only food, right? You get all sort of things like, you know, groceries, like books, like, mm -hmm. you know, shirts and, and all sort of stuff like sport, sport wears and jackets. Yeah. So if, if somebody hadn't gone to Johor, and they went to a night market, what kind of food would you suggest for them to try? I think like, you know, like the Apam Bali, like Ota Ota and yeah. like Sate and, you know, all this, you know, like in a big pan, they are frying the noodles, mm -hmm. chakwe, they are fried rice. Yeah. And I mean, all sort of things like part of our, like a must in our bucket list when we yeah. go to night market. And you know, like the soy bean cut, like the, oh, the how yeah. far we call it, you know, mm -hmm. all, all that is like a, a must and the uh, uh, grilled corn and yeah. all sort of things. Yeah. Well, you saw me eating the otak otak. I, okay. I found that really strange because in the UK, we normally, for starter, we'll have maybe garlic bread or nuts. Okay. And when I saw the otak otak, that was the first time I actually tried it in Malaysia. And I thought okay. it was really strange that okay. they had fish for a starter, but I thought it was really cool. Um, and that as well, it's, it's so cheap. I'm okay. thinking to myself, yeah, I mean, like, I'm basically the fish. night market food normally will be a bit cheaper. Uh, yeah. Because it's, it's like a street food and, and, you know, and people serve in a small portion. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, if, if you're traveling to Malaysia, don't just come to KL, go to Johor because the night markets are great. You can find so many different things. You've got seafood, you've got so many different restaurants. And as I've mentioned for the third time now, it's really cheap. It's so cheap. Yes, yes. So much things. Award-winning tour guide Chalkani Abbas joins our co-founder Paul Gray, who has never visited Malaysia, and talks to him about places to visit in Johor. So Chalkani, what can you tell us about this glass? What can you tell me about this glass temple? And um, right. yeah, <laughs> yes, Paul, this temple is known as Aruli, Arumiga Sri Raja Kaliman Glass Temple. And for your information, right, Paul, this is the the first and only glass temple in Malaysia has stayed in, and is listed in the Malaysian Book of Records. So we are, okay. it's a very different, it's very different wall, uh, this temple from other temples. The only one. Okay, okay uh, that's really yeah. cool. Uh, mm. It must have been really hard and really expensive to create. <laughs> yeah, maintenance too. But uh, yeah. it's a, really a must for, for you to travel to Johor, have a look at this temple. It's very unique. But... Remember, when you visit this temple, please remove your shoes. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and also make a small donation to the temple. Right? Okay, that's, that's really cool. Like, I mean, the thing is, especially traveling as a Westerner, you know, I'm not used to a lot of the different um, values and beliefs held by the people and sort of the practices. So it's yeah. nice to sort of respect other people's values when you go there and... Um, I think when I go to Malaysia, I definitely want to see this because it looks really impressive. And, you know, it's nice just to see, you know, different people and different sort of um, places of worship. So, yeah. Yeah, true. Because uh, the Hindu population in Malaysia is less than 10% of the total population of Malaysia. So it's a quite interesting temple you should visit. Okay. And how, how long would a tour through this temple take? Well, it depends on uh, if you are a photographer, it takes a long time, but usually make it around one, an hour. I think it's enough for an hour there. Now mm -hmm. you are looking at uh, Recreation Park. This is somewhere in uh, Mount Opia, at the foot of Mount Opia. It's a Recreation Park, and uh, they have a lot of uh, chalets and waterfall and pools for you to enjoy yourself there. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Okay. That was very no informative. Problem. And thank you yeah, I can't wait to see it. <laughs> yeah, okay, bye. Renee Jufri is a Michelin trained five star hotel executive chef and part of Masters of Malaysian Cuisine. He was born and raised in Malaysia and spent part of his childhood in Johor. 
He joins me to talk about Mirabus Johor, which I attempted to make for the first time. <laughs> so, Renee, tell me about Johor, because I find, like, on my very, very brief trips to Johor, that the food is really like delicious, but I can't quite put my finger on it. Um, so, what is so special about Johor food? So, okay, Johor. Johor is quite unique. Uh, I would say, like other parts of Malaysia, though. Uh, why it's it is quite different in a sense because where it's located one uh geographically because remember okay you have malacca that's that's the the, the main part where all the uh the spices comes and all those so the next city that got hit with the culture is actually joho all right so and also they are in the coastals so this is one thing that uh makes it quite unique in a sense and how it's diverse in uh, ingredient and culture itself. So, Joho, if you want to say Joho, all right, uh, you get a lot of seafood at one. At the yeah. same time, you also have uh, like noodles, you have uh, most of the street food kind of go into a bread uh, base as well uh, with beef, something with gravy, uh, a lot about noodles, uh, like gravy noodles, you can say. Even as uh, asam pedas, asam pedas people do relate uh, about Johor as well because again they quite near to uh, Malacca, right, along the coastal and all the spices. So Johor, if you know, if you wanna know about Johor food, it has spice around it. So to make it easy to understand, if you notice every single dish that you try in Johor, it has spice, but again okay. in a different twist. Okay. So that's okay. how Johor works. Yes. Okay, interesting. Okay, so I'm going to uh, play this clip for you. Now, I have had Mirabus in Seremban and it was very, very different. But I, I thought that, the you know, just like most people who grew up in Malaysia, the version of whatever dish you eat in your part of Malaysia, you think that's how it should be done, right? So that was the case with Mirabus. Until I came across Mirabus Johor, like I said, I had to Google it and also I remember our chef Bob, our MOMC chef Bob, he made a Mirabus uh, gearbox, I think it was one time, right? So this one has that vibe. It's instead of using, um, what do you call it, gearbox, I'm using just bones here. So I've got the sweet potato that I'm steaming. And in the meantime, I'm actually pressure cooking some beef bones and some beef ribs here. Um, yeah. But I noticed when I Googled Mirabus Johor that there are a few different versions. So that's really confusing. Um, so this is kind of like a little bit of a mix of like a couple of different versions and also it's simplified, you know. Um, so I'm just using brown onions, which, you know, here in Australia, yeah. that's really all I use. I don't use a mixture of small shallots and like big onions. I just use straight out big onions. Um, and also we've got some garlic that's going to come into play. But yeah, um, the Mirabos I grew up eating in Seremban was actually vegetarian. Very, very spicy and very, very savory. No sweetness in it at all. This one I hear that Mirabos Johor is meant to be a bit sweet. Is that right? Correct. Uh, Mirabos Johor, it has that sweet because of your sweet potato that you use. You okay. must have that, yes. So you now, have the savory and sweet, yes. What I want to clarify is moa. I hear a lot about moa, right? And mi bandung. Um, so how is mi bandung different to mi rebus? So mi bandung and mi rebus, uh, with the same, it has the same foundation of uh, ingredient and spice. Okay. But uh, moa, it's, it's a little bit more of its uh, additional, uh, what do you call this? Uh, the ingredients that they use. So okay. by, by texture wise as well, the okay. Mua one has more uh, body. Okay, sense, okay. Yeah, it's more thicker. Okay, so, and by the way, the spices, yeah. I just use onion, garlic, and uh, what do you call it? Uh, dried shrimp here. So I, I, all the recipes call for galangal and mm -hmm. ginger. I just cut them out because I, I wanted to keep this fairly simple. And having said that, even though it's simplified, it is still quite, it still took me quite a long time to make this. <laughs> it took me like about one and a half hours, you know. And I'm just adding some baba's uh, curry powder here, mm -hmm. uh, some big curry powder. Is that normal to to do that in a mirabus or? So in Mirabos, uh, not really normal to, to put a, a curry powder. Curry. 
Okay. Yeah. Right. So it can be an option. So it's because of uh, where, again, everyone in uh, the, the areas they have their own preference. So if in in, a, in an area that is quite near towards uh, the, the the I would say near to near to Malacca area, they have, they intend to put more spice. You, you okay. find that it's more spice. But if it's towards actual uh, the central or towards for the south. It's right. a bit more milder. It's only the chili of it that you get. Oh, right. Okay. Yes, I use some chili powder in there. And also, yeah. I noticed some of the recipes added tau chio, which is like a ground bean paste. So I yeah. put some of that in there. But it's not something I would have thought to add in a mirror bus. Is that a joho thing or is that like so, quite common? Yeah, for, for tau chio, it's, uh, it's not really a joho thing. It's more uh, <laughs> in, in, Actually, it's more towards the Nyonya, the, the Chinese. Okay, sure, the sure. Sweet. Yeah. Oh, so sure. Because of the sweet, because some, some flavors between savory and sweet. It's, okay. Uh, for some people, they won't be able to, to, to get the flavor, right? So okay. So like how to, to, to be in the middle, to, to, sure. to meet the flavor, yes. Right, right. So I've just mashed up the sweet potato, as you saw, and just added in there. And now I'm adding some gula malaka, some palm sugar in there. Um, is that what you would do as well with the, and some salt now and and of course I I, you know, I use chicken powder all the time but I, yeah you you can pretend I didn't say that all right because I never <laughs> Renee is our super elite Michelin chef but anyway but yeah so would you actually add some of those stuff that I did or not really so palm, for palm sugar you can have some because okay. uh, again it depends on the meat that you use. If you use a fresh, fresh uh, cut meat, then uh, okay. you might opt for the uh, for the palm sugar because it, the meat is fresh and sweet. Okay. okay. So that's that's how it works, and also your sweet potato kind of reacts to it. So if you use bones, more of a bone, so you can uh -huh. put some palm sugar. So at least okay. it helps out. Yeah. Right, that. right. Um, you know, I'm cheating here. What I'm using actually, I'm just deep frying some crackers. Because um, I know with some of the recipes I came across, they made their prawn fritters to Sorry. go with it. But I yeah. wanted to simplify because it, it would end up taking me two hours to make this. So I just used some, this would be prawn crackers, except I didn't have any prawn crackers. So these are actually cassava crackers. Um, just, you know, like I said, just to give it that crunchy texture. Um, but again, it's, by the way, so if, you, if you guys are watching this, this is not... Like no recipe actually said to use crackers. That was a Jackie M thing, okay? <laughs> so I'm just adding the, the, the stock now. Um, it's, that's the other thing. Because the version of Mi Rebus in Suramban that I had was vegetarian, it never occurred to me to have any beef or any beef stock in it at all. Is that quite common um, uh, in Johor or? Yeah, so for Mi Rebus Johor, it must have chunks of beef inside and you get all the flavors of the actual broth from the beef. So, Mira uh -huh. Bojo has to be beef, but obviously, when it oh, comes to vegetarian, yes. then they will change it uh, without the beef, or for, what do you call this, for chicken maybe, you can opt, but very oh. rarely that you find the chicken uh, Mira Bojo, it's always beef. Okay, interesting, interesting. Okay, so I just basically um, boiled some noodles here. Is that the typical kind of noodles you would use? Those are like just Hokkien noodles. Yeah, so your typical uh, yellow noodle, the egg yeah. noodle, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's anything that you can grab from there. So it's okay. fine. Yeah. Cool, cool. So I just had a boil. It was a, like, I meant to boil it harder, but it just turned out soft boiled. But I like soft boiled eggs anyway. So I'm just garnishing it with the fried tofu and some of the cracker and some of the sauce and garnishing it with some spring onion and some chilies. So yeah. that's my attempt at Mirobo's Joho. So does that pass muster? What do you think, Renee? I mean, it's uh if you say you wanna do something like this on the street food, it's, it's already a good uh, approach to it. It looks, it has the looks already, the color, right? Okay. The elements is there. Well, thank you so much for this, Renee. I really appreciate it. Our masters of Malaysian cuisine chefs, Bob Atnin, Dave Murugaya, and Renee Jufri answer the question: What dishes do you think of when you think of Johor? Hello guys, uh, just want to tell you guys, if I want to think about Joho, I will think about two dishes from Joho. First is Otak Otak, definitely from Otak Otak Gelang Patah, and another one, definitely Mi Bandung Mua. Super delicious. You should try it.
Hi guys, I'm vegan chef Dave. Okay, uh, since I'm from Johor, uh, if you ask me what are the top three things that really famous in Johor and that you should try it out, uh, I would say maybe um, Mi Bandung, uh, Mi Soto, Laksa Johor. Oh my god, everything is noodle, right? Okay, uh, if I think about Johor dishes, okay. Uh, my top favourites, I would say Laksa Johor uh, Then Mutabak Cheese uh, in Majidi And uh, Kueh Lopez, don't forget about that uh, Kacang Full And uh, Mi Rebus And also uh, Asam Pedas So those are my top dishes if I think about Johor well, I hope you enjoyed our little tour of Johor and all its beautiful food. Now, if you want the recipes, don't forget to sign up at malaysianchefs.com slash streetfoodjourneys and we'll send it out to you once it's ready, along with all the bonus content that we could fit into this episode. And we're back here next week for Paham. I'll see you then. Have a great week ahead. I'm Jackie M. This episode of Street Food Journeys features Zaleha Open making pulut panggang, Marco D, yours truly making nasi kabuli, Shaukani Abbas, Ken Abroad, Ikan Patin in Tamorlo, and the MOMC and MOMC at Heart chefs answer the question What dish do you think of when you think of Pahang? Okay. So, berapa lama dah nuru dekat Bazar Ramadan? Uh, dua tahun. Dua tahun. Sebab tahun lepas lah. So, I kiranya I... ni macam nuru daripada uh. awal memang meniaga kan? Uh -huh. uh, tak ada kerja lain kan? Uh, Maksudnya tak memang meniaga uh, punca rezeki nuru. Uh. Okey. Saleha Olpin, also known as That Rendang Lady, is a Masters of Malaysian Cuisine chef and was born and raised in Pahang. She shows us how to make pulut panggang, Pahang style. Alright, Zaleha, uh, what are you making in this next segment? Ah, I'm making something really, really nice from my hometown, uh, Kuantan. Because the segment is for Pahang, I thought this is something that I really love to eat when I go home. Uh, they sell it on the street, obviously, in, uh, especially in the morning near my, like, near my mom's house. There's a huge field where we feed, we'll see a lot of stalls, a lot of little stalls. And this is one of my favorite one because this lady has been, uh, selling this for the last, like, 20 years, I think. She just stand there and she just make it fresh and bake it on this little satay, uh, burner, uh, with charcoals and everything. So it's called Pulut Panggang or basically we translate it as glutinous rice that you fill with some uh, fish floss, wrap it back into a log and you bake it on a barbecue. Okay, okay, yeah. Hmm. Well, um, let's uh, get the video going. But I had pulut panggang in my hometown in Seremban as well, but mm -hmm. we don't use fish. From memory, they use uh, dried shrimp, which was how yeah. I made it as well when I had my restaurant. But I yes. I'm curious to see your version. Yeah, I think uh, the Kuantan and the Trangano version, because we are so close to Trangano, our food are so much influenced by Trangano as well. If you go to the other side, like Pekan, where the royal town is, then that food is more of pure Pahang. So it's like when you're at the border of Trangano, you get all the influence from Trangano. The Pulut Panga that I'm making is 
also made in uh, Kuala Terengganu as well with um, it's a white fish floss. The one that you're saying, the one you're talking about, the one with prawns, are uh, actually what we call pulut udang. Okay. Did you use yes. fresh prawns or did you use dried prawns? A dried prawns. That one's okay. dried prawns and coconut and coconut floss, okay. if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's how yeah, I made it. Yeah. Oh, so you call it pulut udang. Okay, okay, yes. interesting. Okay. Yeah, cool. it's just it's just different states, I think. And I, I remember Chef Joe was saying about some of them call it pulut lepe as well. Isn't it? Oh, right. Yeah. Okay, I, didn't, I didn't know that. Okay, yeah, that's in Tengano, they call it pulut lepe. But in Pahang, we call it either pulut panggang or pulut udang. And that's it. Okay, okay. I've never heard it called pulut udang. But let's let's get the video going. Okay, so yeah, um, yeah just... Talk us through what you're doing and I'll just hit you with questions as we go. Yes, of course. So the first thing you need to do is to cook the rice. So I'm doing a simplified method here by just cooking them in the rice cooker. The traditional, some or older generations would steam the rice and then put the coconut milk in. But I just put everything to the rice cooker, some salt, a little bit of sugar, coconut milk and um, a little bit of oil just to hold the rice nicely. Stir it and then put it on the rice setting, cook it. But the only thing is you still need to soak the rice for at least two hours, the glutinous rice, for at least two hours before you cook them. Okay, do you okay. use uh, cold water to soak it in or hot water? Yep, just a simple cold water, put it, soak okay. it in for two hours or longer if you like, but at least for two hours and that's it. Cook the rice. Set it aside and you can start with your uh, the fish floss. Cool, cool. What sort of fish are you using here? The one I'm using here is called Baza Filet. Uh, the best, obviously, would be um, Spanish mackerel or we call it ikan kembung in Malaysia. Yeah? But you, I can't get it here, not all the time. So this is the one I'm using. And to be honest with you, these are like less, um, less fishy. So the family prefers a less fishy fish less fishy fish there you go um so that's why i use baza filet i just actually basically poached it in a uh, salt and one tamarind skin for about like 10 15 minutes until it's cooked through and then pound it in a uh, pestle and mortar i just, like just, how using a mortar and pestle to pound it with because I, I, yeah. I i never thought to do that i would have just thrown it in the pestle it's only half kilo of fish. If I do for my K3, it goes in uh, my mixer. <laughs> Trust uh, me. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. So once it's pounded, you know that the fish is actually cooked, but you you need now to just flavor the floss because at the moment it's just salt and a little bit of. Uh, you also need what else do you need? Um, you need sugar. You need salt. I'm just going. You're just going to see me adding in the coconut milk now. Um. So no desiccated coconuts in it? No, no desiccated coconuts. That, that is shallots that's gone in. Uh, thinly sliced shallots, uh, julienne, ginger, a little bit of garlic if you prefer. If not, you can always opt it out. That is a fenugreek, um, sugar, one to two tablespoons. Um, salt goes in as well. And um, finally add in coconut cream. You can always use coconut milk no problem. I like coconut milk because I like, I prefer the more creamy um, uh, fish floss. Okay. So you will cook this on medium to low heat. It takes quite a while to stir because you have to keep stirring it. You don't want to burn it. Just sure. keep going, cook, stir and stir until it's slightly dry. It's like floss. You don't want it to be too dry. You want some moisture in it, but you don't want it watery. Okay. So you just keep, yeah, you just, you just keep stirring this. Sure. Was that pepper that you just added in or? Yes. Okay. I forgot to put the pepper just now, so I quickly add in the black pepper, but you should put it together with all the other ingredients just now. Sure. So you see it's, it's, see it's drying nicely. Okay. It's not really dry. It's still wet. It's still heavy, but it's not too dry because too dry, your pulut panga will be like, a little bit tasteless sure so you set those aside and you actually soften the banana leaves you can there's two ways to soften the banana leaves you could actually put it on the grill just now or you could uh, put it in hot water 
Okay, sure, sure. Yeah. Now you've done the rice just now. Now I'm just uh, brushing some oil onto the banana leaves before okay. I add in the rice. Yeah, so you just flatten the rice into how big is entirely up to you. You want it big, the one that the matchy sells to me is really massive. So I'm making probably, yeah, probably medium size. And this is the best bit. You can put as much uh, floss as you like. It doesn't matter. You can also put more rice on top to cover the floss. It's entirely up to you how big, how much you want. That's the best thing about home cooked, homemade pulut panggang. Sometimes I'm when really you buy from the yeah, sometimes when you buy from the shop, you get very little fillings. You know, yeah. you just really upset. So yeah, yeah, I'm surprised so, you said that the, the lady who sold it made it really big. Because in Malaysia, I always tell people, oh, everything in Malaysia is small. And uh -huh. This is really hers is really massive. She's selling for two two ringgit, one piece. It's it's big. Yeah, so okay. that's that's basically you fold it and nicely pack it in. Put the toothpaste on, yeah, fold it nicely and you just keep doing that and then you put on to your grill. You could use barbecue, charcoal barbecue, that's the best. But I just because of the demo, I just do it inside the house and yeah. I just use the grill. And you just brush some oil onto it. Yep. So so the, the it penetrates into the pulut panga. The longer you cook it, the better. I okay. prefer, to be honest with you, I prefer it nice and soft, but some people, uh, some like it crispy inside, like really okay. nice and brown inside. So it's also entirely up to you how you like your pulut panggang. Oh. Yeah. This this is actually, oh, even looking at this, I'm, I want it again. It's, <laughs> I love this. This is actually my favorite, one of my favorite uh, morning kueh when I go home. And yeah. the first thing we do the next morning is like go buy breakfast or go for yeah. roti canai, you know, things like that. These are the yeah. things that I miss most about Malaysia. Yeah, yeah, same here. The, um, mm. Now, with your banana leaves, are they fresh banana leaves or are they frozen leaves? This one I bought specifically fresh ones because I know when I buy a frozen one, I will always get really a lot of hair, tearing in there. So I bought fresh ones. That cost ah. me about £9 for about <gasps> two long leaves. Yep. Oh my god. <laughs> it's so expensive, but you know what? It's worth it. Now, if you I don't have the leaves, like, would you use something else for it? You could wrap it in a uh, baking baking paper. You could wrap it in, uh, just oil the baking paper, wrap it in the baking paper, tuck it in tightly, or and then wrap it again in the foil and put it on the barbecue. That that works as well. Okay, interesting, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Now you were saying earlier that like Chef Joe says that it's called leper, did you say? Is it Le Pulut Lepa? L E P A Pulut Lepa in Tangani. Oh, okay. Yeah, L -E -P -A. apparently. Okay. Um yeah. because you know what this reminds me? It reminds me of the Indonesian uh, lemper ayam. Um they call it lemper, L E M P E R. I wonder ah. if it's a word. But it's also sticky rice, but yeah. Oh that looks oh, wow. good. I'm gonna try and make. I've never thought to make it with fish before. So try it. Right. Try it. Yeah. If you, I mean, I know I'm a fan. I'm a big fan of uh, seafood, so I would do fresh prawns as well. But this is the traditional for Kuantan and Trungganu. I, uh, it's a white uh, sambal, white uh, fish floss. If the mm -hmm. prawns, I think they will put a uh, cheese in there, so it's it slightly red. Okay. Red okay. filling. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this one has no chili at all, no, 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 no. spice. Okay. No, so the heat comes from the black pepper. You want it, you want it, uh, yeah, you want it hotter, you add more pounded black pepper. Oh, fantastic. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much for this, uh, Zaleha. I'm going to try no it. No problem. Know. Okay. Thank I'll you. See you bye. I'll see you later. Ciao. See you. Bye bye. Marco D is an Englishman based in Malaysia. He is a TikTok and YouTube star and a TV presenter. He went on a food hunt in Pahang. So I'm here now on the outskirts of Kuantan. We're by the highway. We've stopped off here. We've had so much food, but we are here now at Kurabop Lakor. Oh, Fatima! I love satong, Sai Suga satong. This one looks awesome. I'm trying it right now. Oh my God. <laughs> Lawa. 
It's really, really prawn goreng. Prawn goreng, 10 out of 10. We are here for the Karapop liqueur. Oh, Vatima, mm. time to try your Karapop liqueur. Very fishy, this one. Usually, the Karapop liqueur is very doughy. It's good. Oh, Fatima! Your Karapop liqueur, Sangasadapla! Very nice. You need another uh, staff here? Uh, I'll be yeah. your staff. I, I come and cook for you. Bole, bole, bole. Yeah, my new job. Bole, Thank you. Good. Peace. So we are in Guantan and apparently everything here is royal. This royal pudding. Pecan royal pudding. Special delicacy. Okay, why is it royal pudding? Because it's meant for the king. So at the bottom we have banana. It's called lemak manis. This we have the yellow, it's actually egg yolk. We have prunes. So with some prunes and also some cashew nuts. Um, is this going on top? Yeah. A drink or no, no. It's just put It's a gravy. It's like custard, like yes, English like custard. custard. Yes, it's like English custard. That looks really good. Mm. It smells so good. But just to let you know, guys. Only kings can have this dish. So. <laughs> right here we go. Wow. That's Malaysian desserts I've actually like. Because <laughs> everything is sweet. It tastes like bananas and custard. Bread and butter pudding, maybe? Yeah, bread and butter it pudding. It tastes like that. It tastes like ever in Kwantan, Le Mak Manis is the thing you have to try. This is one of the best things I've tried all trip. Yeah. Royal pudding, yeah. try it. My Masters of Malaysian Cuisine co-founder Paul Gray joins me to talk about Nasi Kabuli. Um, so Paul, Nasi Kabuli, I've never heard of it. I had to Google it. Um, and according to Zaleha, who is from Pahang, it was actually a dish that was invented for the Sultan, for royalty. I did not expect it. It, it seems pretty <laughs> simple enough, you know, so I'm excited to see how it goes. Yeah. Let's have a look. I've never seen it. So just like you've never seen it, so neither have I. <laughs> okay, so I'm just adding like these uh, onions and actually the recipe did not call for garlic, but I like garlic, so I threw some garlic in. Um, and garlic gin garlic. Yeah, I know, right? So I'm using a big onion, but in Malaysia, they would have used like a combination of big onions and small shallots. And I'm adding some lemongrass here as well. The lemongrass I use is like frozen and already minced up. So I just kind of like guesstimated how much to put in. Um, I talk about how awesome that is. <laughs> I know it doesn't look very attractive, <laughs> um, but it's a shortcut from my business days. And I'm just adding some pepper in there. But uh, the interesting thing about this dish is that it uses coriander. Like, so I'm just pounding some coriander seeds in the mortar and pestle. And then I'm going to add them to the food processor slash bread blender as well. Um, and other ingredients that would go in would be turmeric. But I'm using turmeric powder, which is why I'm not adding it here. But you could use fresh turmeric as well. And also galangal. You could use fresh galangal. But again, shortcut, I'm using powdered galangal because it's already in powder form. It doesn't go in the food processor. But if you were using the, you know, the fresh versions, you would actually blend it along with all the other spices. And now I'm just uh, transferring it into a pan to fry it up, uh, just like with a lot of Malaysian cooking. So I'm just adding the turmeric here. A lot with a lot of Malaysian cooking, you would fry, and that's the galangal powder. You would actually. Okay. <laughs> so I'm just uh, frying it up, and usually with Malaysian recipes, you fry up this spice paste that you call rempa in oil okay but i like to actually I, I i've added the oil now i think that was uh, yeah that didn't show up but i actually would have um i i i actually dry fry it first to remove some of the moisture before i add the oil in so it doesn't spit as much uh, that's just a jackie m hack okay <laughs> and after frying the spices I then add the, these are what we call here in Australia, chicken Maryland pieces. So it's the thigh plus the 
drumstick attached together. Mm, weird Australians. <laughs> what do you call it? Uh, quarter, I think. Basically. Quarter. Yeah. Whatever. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> quarter could mean the top quarter, you see? Okay, so I'm just putting in some salt. And also, being Jackie, I'm, I'm, I'm going to add some chicken powder to it as well, okay? But the original recipe did not call for chicken powder. Um, so, like I said, my caveat is I do not know this dish. And I had to Google it. And this was the recipe I came up with, okay? But it seems pretty straightforward. So, I'm just going with it. Yeah, nothing seems really tricky so far. And, um, yeah, it looks simple but very flavorful by the looks of it. Yeah, there are uh, another uh, a separate recipe that actually I mean there are always like variations in different, from different sources, and this is basmati rice. So I'm just going to actually you know typically you would rinse it and then like strain it, but because I'm not near a sink at the moment, I just basically pour water over it and then I'll just uh, strain it later on. But the idea is to get your rice wet, but. Um, yeah, so with this, we're just going to cook it till the chicken is done. Um, and because they're chicken Maryland pieces, they can take a little while to cook, okay? So you're looking at at least 20 minutes, 25 minutes or something like that. You want to cook it all the way through. Um, as I was saying earlier, there are other recipes out there that actually tell you to marinate the chicken with salt and um, the turmeric first you know, for a few uh, hours before you cook it. I mean, I don't see the point in it, but so I skip <laughs> because it's all going to be going in there and being boiled anyway, right? Mm -hmm. So once it's cooked, you then take it out and you want to dry it, okay? Now, um, typically, if you were in a rush, uh, if you weren't in a rush, you would actually let it sit in the marinade, you know, for a while so that it soaks up more of the flavors. Mm -hmm. But... I, I did it straight away and it actually turned out fine, right? So that's the leftover marinade and you don't waste it, okay? But anyway, I, I, I forgot to mention, after I fried the spice paste, I took a little bit of it out, which I'm just adding back to the pan now. Um, and that's going to be for the rice. So we're going to be using the same spice mixture and we're just going to um, fry up the rice with it, just to, the raw rice, just to make it aromatic. It, this recipe, this technique actually reminds me a little bit of Hainanese chicken rice because I used to sell Hainanese chicken rice at my restaurant where we basically do the same thing. We would like do a, a I mean, different set of ingredients, um, but we would actually fry up the rice with oil and with um, the spices and then we would then cook the rice in the rice cooker, right? So, except, again, we weren't using basmati, we were using jasmine rice, but the, the idea is the same. Okay. This is, yeah, it's almost very uh, Indian. I mean, I don't know in India, India, but I know with a lot of the Indian population in South Africa, is that we have dishes where they do that to the rice. Sure, yeah, yeah. And um, with basmati rice, it takes, I'm just using some of the stock from the, you know, the what was used to poach the chicken to, uh, cook the rice with and it wasn't what the recipe said but I figured like you know why use water when you use flavor yeah the result was that my rice looks a bit more yellow than what I saw <laughs> on my but like same, you know? so I just heated up some oil here and then you're gonna fry the chicken up a second time right uh, at this point, you want the chicken to be. I actually had, had dried it with some paper towel. Yeah, and yeah, also so that it doesn't spit all over in the oil. But remember, the chicken is going to hundred percent cooked too by simmering it with the water. So this should not take too long. Okay, you just want to cook up the, the the chicken. Um, and the rice is done. I just used the rice cooker and just cooked it up and fluffed it up. And basmati rice takes more water, so when you steam it, uh, when you when you cook it, you want more water um, to yeah. cook it. Yeah. So just presenting it here. What would have gone well with this? Uh, like Zaleha recommended that you could serve this with a tomato sambal, right? So like a chili condiment that has some tomato, like you know, tomato in it as well. And um, I actually ate this with a blachan, samba blachan. Um, <laughs> it's not. It makes sense. 
Yeah. So Alan's like it would work well. I asked Saleha, like, does this actually come with like, um, you know, something, you know, she says no, because typically when they serve it in Bahang, they would serve this with other dishes as well that do have sauce, like maybe a curry or something like that. So the curry sauce would be then, you know, used over the rice. But as, is, mm-hmm. as it stands, it's just like that. So just the fried chicken, crispy, you know, fried chicken, uh, mm-hmm. the rice. And some, I just garnished it with some cucumber. And also remember the water, the stock that was used to poach the chicken with. Um, mm-hmm. It was uh, quite, uh, I guess, a little bit salty because it was reduced, right? I basically cooked it up again by adding more water to it and then turned it into a broth to serve the chicken with. So that worked out really well. I'm just sprinkling it with a spring onion here. So, yeah, it's a good looking dish and it's got sort of those Indian vibes. So it looks really good to me. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's pretty simple. I don't generally actually like to cook chicken Maryland in such a big piece like this because, you know, they're hard to cook all the way through. Um, so you just want a little bit of patience to make sure that it's, you know, it's simmered properly and you would want a bit of patience to let it like drain on a draining rack. Or if you rush it through like I did, I patted it dry with paper towels and then I fried it up sort of thing. So there's just a couple of steps. But as far as, um, yeah, the ingredients that go into it, pretty straightforward. Um, so give it a yeah, go. Yeah, I like it. I'm definitely going to try it. <laughs> Good, because the ingredients are, are pretty universally available. I think nothing too exotic, right? Cool. Okay. Well, make sure you try Thanks it. Thanks so much. Yeah, will do. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Shalkani Abbas, an award-winning tour guide from Malaysia, joins us again to talk about places to visit in Pahang. So Shalkani, uh, I have never been to Taman Negara, but I think it's really quite spectacular, isn't it? Yes. Anyway, Taman Negara is our national park in Malaysia, in the peninsula. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 read online, I read online that it's the oldest tropical rainforest in the world. Is that right? Yeah, I much, never realized. Much older than Amazon. <laughs> I, I, see, I never realized that because when you grow up in Malaysia, you think, oh, it's just a forest, you know, no big deal. But now yeah. when I'm looking at the photos and all that, it's really quite spectacular. So let's yeah. have a look. So yeah, this looks really, really nice. Yes, because uh, Everything in Tamaragara, you have to use a boat to visit all these places of interest, like the Orang Asli village, the aborigines of the of uh, Tamaragara. They are the Batik tribe, and they are one of the eighteen subspecies of minority Indian group of Malaysia. And also, we can go for a boat ride to a, a stream where at the end of the stream, the boat cannot go through. That's where you can swim all this like while the waterfall and camping also can be done by the river fishing like traditional fishing which we see now in the picture right and uh, some places in the Tamaragara fishing is pro- prohibited because they need to protect the wildlife there like this is a freshwater fish some are really wow. big one so is it dangerous riding on the boats or no it's it's safe <laughs> because the boatmen are all experts they're okay. experts they're licensed like the one you see in the picture now is the longest walkway in the world 500 okay. meters long wow, wow. Yes. it's pretty amazing and this is my this is my favorite jackie rapid shooting yeah. <laughs> so you can soak from top to toe <laughs> it looks and, dangerous uh, <laughs> yeah, it's nice. And if you need to see wildlife, you can go to any of the observation tower and uh, you can sometimes see animals at the salt lake. Well, can you see tigers there? No tigers. The, okay. the tigers see you, but they won't, you won't see them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so would you, how long would you spend in Taman? Would you stay overnight in, those, uh, in Taman Negara? Or? Uh, at least two nights in Taman Negara. And the best time to go there is between June, July, August, because okay. it's a bit dry, and also okay. the fruit the fruit season is there during the month oh. of the, this month. Yeah. Okay. What what sort of fruit do you get? 
Well, durian. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Mangosteen, rambutan. Oh. That's the best time to go. So what, they grow wild or they farm? No, there's orchards around there. Okay. So you can see them selling along the roadside. Okay, okay. So, now, yeah. I think it's a, uh, an, an elephant sanctuary in Tamanagara, is it? No, it's out, before reach Tamanagara, there is one elephant sanctuary. Okay. But uh, this sanctuary is a translocation area for wild animals, especially elephants. Okay. So elephants which are injured, get separated from their herd or baby elephant get separated they will be caught and bring brought to the sanctuary and they okay. will be taken care of by the authority then later they will be released in a better environment okay okay and of course finally with bahang there's cameron highlands with the tea plantations right yes because of the weather there is cool right so people like to go there uh to to cool off yeah and uh the only place in malaysia which can can find tea is cameron highland oh and, really yeah we malaysian are tea drinkers so we love to go cameron highland to see the tea plantation okay cool <laughs> well i'm definitely going to taman nagara and i might check out the tea plantations in cameron highlands as well well thank you so much for this shaukani always very informative i love talking to you about all these beautiful <laughs> thank things. you very much <laughs> all right i'll see you next Bye. time ken abroad is from germany he's a full-time traveler around southeast asia he visited pahang not so long ago it is time to try one of the most popular foods here in Malaysia, satay. All right, I was just told that they actually cook the satay outside. So let's have a look how, how they prepare it actually, because I think that's interesting. Hi, hello. hello. Ah, over there. Ah, okay, let's uh, have a look. Ah, I would like to, to see how you make it. Yeah. So we have the fresh ones here, yeah, and already finished here, right? Which uh, which uh, type is this? Is it chicken? Beef, beef, beef. 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 Oh, that's it's a beef chicken one. Ah. Chicken over there. Oh, it smells already. It's fresh, like fresh barbecue around here. That's really cool. Yeah, it's a, it's a really popular um, uh, street food meal as well in Malaysia. Normally you can get one piece for about one winget, so that's like 20 cents, sometimes even less. Okay, and uh, how many uh, how many minutes you need to put them here? Uh, ten minutes. Ten minutes only, and then easy. Ten minutes. Oh. Okay, I'm excited to try it. This is the mutton. The mutton, okay. Yeah. For the rabbit, this is the rabbit. The rabbit. And the, this is the stomach. The, the stomach. Stomach. Uh, okay. okay. This is the liver. Liver. Chicken and beef. Chicken and beef. Yeah. Okay, the food has arrived. Yeah, it looks really nice. I'm a little bit scared of the liver because I'm not sure if I'm gonna like that. But okay. So and um, yeah, we also have a, a chuck of, of sauce here. So some sauce and as a side dish, I have this. So some uh, some cucumbers and onions and some uh, rice cake. So I'm excited. Let's go. Okay, I think we're going to start simple with, with the beef because I'm pretty sure I like the beef and the chicken one. So, um, I don't know, do you just um, dip it in here normally? I will just try it raw before, uh, for, uh, before I dip it into the sauce. Mm, oh wow. mm, really good. Let me adjust the camera a little bit. Mm, okay. So, yeah, it's like a barbecue grilled beef. Mm, really good. I had the opportunity to visit Tamorlo in Pahang, which is famous for its catfish. Being in the tropics, Malaysia is full of waterways, and in the middle of the country is the riverside town of Tamorlo. It's a pretty spot and home to a Malaysian delicacy I was keen to try. But first, I wanted to see where it came from. I think I can hear the fish already. 
Be careful. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, here we go. So I've made my way to Tamolo, which is inland from Kuala Lumpur. Now, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> the, now, Tamolo is actually at the junction of two rivers, the Pahang River and the Samantan River. I'm told that Tamolo is actually referred to as Bandar Ikan Patin, which means a patin fish town. Patin fish apparently is a kind of local catfish that's caught in the rivers over here. So I'm going to do what a lot of people in the past have done, that is uh, travel all the way to Tamolo to actually try the fish here. And I've got a local chef here, Eddie, to help me out with that. Eddie, tell me about this fish farm. This is where you get your fish for yes, your yes, restaurant? Yes, yes. How big do they grow to? Uh, one and a half or two kilo. One and a half and two uh, kilos. Okay. Now, I know that you can catch the fish in the river, but mm. why are they farming it here? Uh, Bigger quay, yeah. Quay, go quay. Ah. Okay, yeah, yeah. And because it's more expensive, basically, I think you know, just over the years, the uh, you know, catching these fish is just getting a little bit tricky, and it's a lot more expensive. Obviously, catching it in the wild, you know, it actually tastes a lot better. But also, to make it uh, sustainable and affordable, they've started farming this fish, so we can still enjoy a delicious uh, ikan patin meal uh, just from this farm fish as well. I see some fish pellets over here. You think we can feed them? Yes, yes, sure. sure oh, great, great, great. This is exciting. Here we come. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Look at them. Wow. I don't want to fall in, but I'm very intrigued by this fish. <laughs> Catfish are normally a bottom feeder and their flesh can taste quite muddy. But these are farms, so their diet can be controlled to ensure a sweeter flavour. It's also a far more environmentally friendly way to source the fish. Operations like this have allowed the wild populations of Patin to come back to more healthy numbers. It has also allowed the supply to be more reliable. Now, as much as I was enjoying the tour of the farm, I was here to taste this famous delicacy. So we headed to Eddie's restaurant just up the hill. <laughs> but I'm very hungry as well. So this is the famous ikan patin, yes, right? Yes, okay. Yes. Can you tell me how you're gonna cook this? Okay, this is the ikan patin, this is the ikan patin, this is the ikan patin, this is the ikan patin. Okay, so how do you do it? Yes, first put this one. Okay. So what he's going to do is that we've got just some pretty basic ingredients. We've got some pureed ginger over here, the shallots, this is soy sauce, and this is just... Oh, rice wine. <laughs> That's definitely rice wine. So Eddie's just smeared some of this over, and Li Lo is Jing Xin, have Yeah. So he's just gonna steam this, and then we're gonna add this at the end, right? Okay, let's go. Okay. So here's the steamer. How long do you steam this for? Uh, eight minutes. Eight minutes. Not long at all. Which is great because I'm hungry. Okay, and just cover this. So eight minutes, it's just enough time for us to go and grab a drink. So we'll come back. In front of the restaurant, there are pools being used as fish tanks to keep the patin as fresh as possible prior to cooking. I won't lie to you, they're not exactly a pretty critter. Okay, let's go, Eddie. Let's see what this looks like. Right? Oh, this is making me so hungry. What are you doing there? You're just mixing the wine with the soy sauce. Okay, fantastic. It's ready to eat now? Yes. Okay, yes. great. You're gonna put some shallots on. I'm going to try this very quickly because I'm really, really hungry here. Let's play that. Oh my goodness, this is fantastic. Now, I'm told by the locals here that the Malays actually do this a little bit different. They use tempoya, which is what's uh, fermented durian apparently, but the Chinese like to keep it quite simple. I'm talking with my mouth full here. <laughs> But they just steam it with some ginger and shallots, but you have to try it. It sounds very easy and it tastes absolutely fantastic. Eddie, I'm gonna eat some more of this. Okay. Oh my goodness. Mm. Our chefs from Masters of Malaysian Cuisine and MOMC at Heart answer the question, what dishes do you think of when you think of Pahang? Uh, when we think, when I think about Pahang, I'm from Pahang, obviously. When I think about Pahang, it's got to be Opo Daging. That is one of my absolute favorite when I go home. There's a special place somewhere in uh, Kuantan that sells this as well. Uh, we do that, but it's a lot of work. It's 
very very similar to uh, rendang um, like Negeri Sembilan they have rendang hijau you got perak you got rendang to and then Kelantan you have kerutuk so paham exclusive is opor daging very very nice and uh, obviously rendang uh, was brought into Malaysia by the migrants uh, from Indonesia and the difference is the rendang the Indonesian rendang is very very dry uh, our opo has lots of gravy on it and it's really dark and delicious hi guys uh, when I think of Pahang I always think about tempoyak patin definitely it's gonna be very very nice delicious uh, food especially from the durian so when you cook with this uh, uh, ikan patin from Temelu. Very nice. Uh, in Pahang, because Pahang is very famous, uh, we eat durian like Musang King and so on. So there are quite a few numbers of dishes are inspired from the uh, delicious durian. Uh, for example, let's say they have a gulai tempoya ikan patin uh, that you have to try. If you are in Kuantan, uh, you can go to some good pastry where they offer this uh, all made from durian and they have uh, durian crab, uh, durian uh, pastries, durian bomb they call it, or durian tat. Or if you are somewhere in Jiranto, Rao or in Kuala Lipis, um, very nice scenery down here, you, you can always go for, uh, they call it gulai asam rong. This asam rong actually is made from the processed uh, rubber tree um, fruits. The other one is uh, if you go to the coast area, you can only look for ikan bakap thai beautiful fish with a good nice uh we call it a stinky bean of course for the sweet uh very famous in uh, pahang is pudding diraja you got to try all of this if i go to if i think of uh, food in pahang okay so of course there's so many uh variety of uh, hawker's food in pahang or, or a street food in pahang but Aha, this is rather rare, but uh, if you are lucky enough, you can find laksa pahang. Laksa pahang is very, very nice. Okay, you probably, some of you might think that, ah, pahang ada laksa. Of course, pahang ada laksa. I know each episode seems to get longer and longer, but even with that, we've got even more content for you, which you can access via our membership area. So make sure you sign up at malaysianchefs.com slash street food journeys, and we'll send you details on how to get to them once we've got everything all set up. And I'll see you back here next week for another episode. And this time we are covering Pair Up. Have a great week ahead. I'm Jackie M. This episode of Street Food Journeys features Mark Odi's Pair Up Food Hunt Yours truly making a dry style Ipo Kaisi Ho Fun A visit to an Ipo Kaisi Ho Fun store A Kuala Kangsa food trail Malaysian tour guide Shalkani Abbas gives us the rundown on places to visit Chef Bob Adnan visiting Kelly's Castle A famous live fun noodle restaurant Chef Bob Adnan making Ipo clay pot chicken rice. One of our viewers gives us his rundown on what to eat in Ipo, Laksa Mi Pulau Panko, and our Masters of Malaysian Cuisine chefs answer the question, what dishes do you think of when you think of Pera?
YouTube and TikTok star Marco D tries Ippo's famous bean sprouts and more in his tour of Ippo. The people of Ippo, they take their food very seriously. Toge is one of them. So we're back here in Ippo and I was feeling a bit hungry and I found a place here called Lao Wong. This place is famous for their Taogei. Now Taogei, for most Westerners, looks like this. It's bean sprouts, but they call it Taogei here and apparently it's really famous in Ippo with the chicken rice. So I've got Taogei chicken rice. Let's try it. The aroma of the chicken rice mixed with the ever so tasty roasted or steamed chicken, whichever you fancy, will make you stop, sit and ask for a plate. They say people have been coming to this shop particularly for years and the main star here is the tage, of course. And when the night comes, things get up and running once again. It seems like the best time to have one of the Ippo's most famous desserts. So I've come here for dessert. This is Alessandro special, which apparently does the best ice kajang in Ipo. Ice kajang, also known as ABC, is this. It's basically a very, a very strange mix of stuff. We've got shaved ice, we've got ice cream, we've got these little things here that look like little worms. Uh, we have like sweet corn, nuts, all mixed together. It's a strange combination, but you know what? I'm gonna give it a go. From my first glance, it looks intimidating with all of the ingredients packed inside one bowl like a snow mountain with oozing sweet delicacies waiting to be eaten by the giants, me. I tell you what, this, I thought I wasn't going to like it, but you know what? It's a unique blend of stuff. We got, you know, things like nuts and sweet corn and ice cream. I wouldn't thought it would go together, but you know what? It really does and it tastes great. I'm going to finish my ice kajan. Ipo is famous for its spicy hao fun or shredded chicken rice noodles. I love eating this, but I also sometimes like to eat it dry style. Here's how I make it. Now in this particular segment, I'm going to make Ipo spicy hao fun, which literally means uh, shredded chicken with uh, fresh rice noodles. Okay. Now this dish is usually served a soup style, but I sometimes like it uh, dry style, what we call gon lo in Cantonese. So I'm going to add an extra step to show you how I would make the gon lo sauce if I do decide to have it that way. Have a look. So the key part of this recipe is the chicken. You want a whole chicken. This is a 1.6 kilo chicken and I'm just poaching it. I've boiled a big pot of water and once it comes to a boil, you throw the chicken in, cover it and simmer it on the low heat for eight minutes. Turn off the heat completely, but keep it submerged and covered for another 40 minutes, okay? In the meantime, I'm just chopping up some garlic chives and also some sliced fresh red chilies. Uh, chilies will just go with some soya sauce. Uh, to go with this dish, but uh, now we're going to make the sauce, the gondo sauce, and I'm using some abalone sauce here, along with some thick soy sauce or cooking caramel or dark soy sauce, depending, uh, it's known by a number of different terms. If you don't have uh, abalone sauce, just use oyster sauce. I'm using half and half oyster sauce and abalone sauce, but you can just use oyster sauce and more of it. Um, otherwise okay and some sesame oil and you can add a little bit of water to this as well and what we're going to do is boil this up until everything is dissolved just throwing in some pepper and some seasoning I, I'm, used, I'm going to use some chicken powder but you can just use a bit of fish sauce a little bit of salt whatever works for you okay so you want to simmer this till it's all dissolved and then you let it cool down and you can uh, just store it in a in a jar or in the fridge or whatever and you can use it for all kinds of noodles now, what we're going to do now is uh, we're just going to uh, cook up some prawns, okay? Uh, prawn shells in particular. I'm using a fair bit of prawn shells here. You don't have to, uh, you don't need that much for this particular dish, but I like it a little bit more prawny than usual, okay? So what I'm going to do is fry up the prawn shells with oil um, and really uh, fry it till it's aromatic, crispy, and the oil is all a nice red, orangey color, right? And then what you want to do, if you were serving this a soup style, this dish, uh, you would add the prawns and the oil into the uh, water, the broth that was used to cook up the chicken, okay? And you can add extra chicken bones in it to make it more flavorsome. Um, 
and then um, I'll just set it aside here because I'm not making this soup style, so I'm just kind of like um, putting it aside and using it differently, okay? But otherwise, you would just pour the whole thing in with the, the, the chicken broth. Uh, now we're going to, I'm um, just actually, you don't need to do this part. This is just the soy sauce. You know the chilies that we're going to serve with these noodles? Usually you would just have some soy sauce in it. Now I find that my soy sauce is a little bit sharp and salty. So what I do is I try and um, give it a, a full body flavor by just adding a little bit more water to it. Uh, again, dissolving it under some heat and adding a little bit of sugar, okay? I also add a, a dash of fish sauce, but again, you don't have to if you don't want to, okay? So that's just otherwise what would be just soy sauce. It really depends on the kind of soy sauce you're using, okay? And that's, like I said, just going to be used with the, uh, with the fresh cut chilies afterwards. Now, um, so what we want to do now is we're going to poach some noodles, what we call ho fun. And the kind of noodles you want for this are the thin cut uh, fresh rice noodles, which you can find at least in Australia anyway, fairly easily in Asian grocery stores, okay? So just bringing the water to a boil, and then we're just going to throw the noodles and we're just going to blanch them quickly. You don't need to cook them for that long at all, right? Um, yeah, so with the prawn shells, again, you know, they will go in with the with the broth that's off camera here. And you just want to simmer it so it's flavorsome, so it's a little bit corny and a little bit chickeny as well, okay? More chickeny than corny, but um, again, up to how you personally like it, right? So this, again, like I said, it doesn't take long. You just want to blanch it quickly, and you want to do it right before you serve. Otherwise, they'll stick together, okay? Okay, so the chicken is out of the water and you want to just shred it, okay? Now that's the key defining feature of this dish, that the chicken is not generally cut up into chunks, it's shredded, hence the name face C, which means shredded chicken. Okay, so I've just got a chunk here. Uh, you want to remove the skin, I prefer to remove the skin. I usually actually separately uh, fry up the skin till it's crispy, okay, for uh, crispy. Uh, you know, crispy chicken skin. But once you've shredded the chicken, you want to just season it. And I'm just adding some sesame oil, pepper, and you can add a little bit of salt or a bit of chicken powder, just give it some flavor, okay? And here I'm going to be using some prawns. The prawns I'm going to poach, okay? Uh, and you would uh, to use the water that you use to poach the chicken in, okay? Which is the chicken broth. And just poach the prawns lightly in the chicken broth. And then uh, I'm just assembling the noodles now, putting them on a plate, and then the prawns will go there. And the broth that was used to poach the prawns, you can add more prawn shells in to make it again more prawny. And then um, I'm just topping the noodles here with some of the shredded chicken, right? And some oil, the oil, the prawn oil, the beautiful fragrant prawn oil. And this is the broth, right? So if you're serving this soup style, you just pour all the broth in it and turn it into a soupy noodle dish. But again, because I'm doing it dry style, I've just basically put a little bit of the soup in it, but topped it up with the dark sauce that I cooked earlier. And uh, in goes the prawns. And then we just garnish it with some crispy fried shallots and crispy uh, garlic granules, if you like. And there you go. So very, very easy dish. And you can have the rest of the broth in a separate little bowl to eat your noodles with, okay? So there you go, that's a Ipo style Gaisi Ho Fun, but dry style, okay? Enjoy! One of our MOMC viewers from Perak visits a hawker stall, Ipo Boy, and has a chat with the owner. Okay, Okay, 
小份啊？小份啊？系。跟住又加下份，加份我哋唔使钱啦。你呢度开好耐噶啦？诶、呃，差唔多八个月。哦，八个月啦，正还得啦。韭菜唔该，韭菜我多啲，嗯，包咧虾唔该，好啊好啊，自己嘅自己做嘅，好啊好啊，自己自己卖，唔系唔系雪藏噶，又会谂到开卖鸡丝河粉嘅，嗯，系啦，中意做食啊，中意食啊，搞下啦，河粉唔系做呢行嘅，哦。咁咪可以揀噶雞髀肉啊，得啊，嗯。嗱、啊，咁你咪要好早起身嚟做啲嘢咯。夜晚做便啦，跟住之後早咪又開咗啤翻啦，整翻自己嘢啦。哦。咁我邊個幫你做喎、啊？工作就我做嘅，但我我嘅 wife 每日就幫手啦。你生咩？包咗魚蛋。哇！呢、這個湯我咬好耐啦，喂。係啊，幾粒鐘㗎？夜晚開始咬啊。嗯。炒湯 OK 冇？炒湯好。自己炒嘅係。多啲炒湯啊！多啲嘅。哇！你呢度咁多人，你會開多地間冇㗎？冇啦，冇諗咁多嘢啦。而家咩行情啊？做邊啊？哦、嗯。嗯呢度几多点开到几多点喎？咁我哋系七点开到一点，七点到一点啦、啊。哦。系、哎。系 ，OK， 唔该，唔该 ，Thank you。Perak's Royal Town is Kuala Gangsa. Here are some dishes to try as compiled by a local group called Gluters. Award-winning tour guide Shalkani Abbas gives us the roundup on places to visit in Perak. Shalkani, how are you today? I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> I remember the time we went to Perak, so we visited a number of places. Uh, so this is actually a good conversation I'm um, looking forward to. Tell me about Perak, what you know about it. Well, Perak has a long been one of the most popular uh, tourist destinations in Malaysia. It is coined as the land of Greece. It is an and it is a, it's a second largest state in the peninsula of Malaysia. And uh, among the places of interest, which always people looking for, is to visit the royal royal town of Perak. It's at Kuala Kangsa. Uh -huh. And uh, as you know, the most beautiful mosque I haven't seen in Malaysia is a Ubudiyah Mosque in Kuala Kangsa. It's something like one thousand and one Arabian night type of mosque. In the Kuala Kangsa, yeah, and yeah. Uh, you you've been there, right? And uh, along the way, we can go to Langong, yeah, the at the, the dam there, the the lake there. It's a very few homestay there. One of them is Suka Suka, yeah, yeah, yeah. Suka Suka. I have Suka. very good memories of Suka Suka. For those of you who um have never been to Perak, if you do go go to Suka Suka, it's like a a, a total getaway. And it's like staying in a kampong with your own hut and all that. And I had Noah yeah. with me. It was so much fun. <laughs> huge house, very huge house, <laughs> traditional yeah. house. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. And then Ipo is one of the. It's a must visit, you know. And uh, Lonely Planet in 2016 voted 
Ipoh as a sixth best place to visit in Asia. Yeah. And also uh, New, York, New York Times and the Lonely Planet also voted Ipoh as top three best coffee town in Asia. Yeah. Even, even Booking.com in 2018 voted Ipoh as top 10 destination to taste local food. Nice, yeah. nice, nice, nice. Uh, yeah. So to me, uh, I love the local food there. The, the, the hawker food there is very, very different from other states in Malaysia. And then you can go to Kelly Castle and down, oh, yeah. down near, near Ipoh. And then you can go also to, uh, they have a place uh, along the highway. It's a, a animal sanctuary. You can find orangutan. Oh, really? Which is, Orangutan only can be found in Sabah and Sarawak, but this yeah. in yeah this place is a sanctuary for the orangutan for research. Oh. And every every orangutan born have a birth certificate. When they are adult, they are released back to the jungle. But there's so much more that I want to see, so I'm looking forward to it. Thanks again so much uh, for this, Shankani. Okay, bye bye. <laughs> okay, I'll see you next time. Ciao. Bye bye. Kelly's Castle is a well-known tourist attraction in Perak. Our MOMC chef, Bob Adnan, dropped in for a visit. Hello guys, uh, we meet again. Uh, now Bob at the Batu Gajah Perak and Bob want to discover about Kelly Castle. Let's go, come follow Bob. And then they have one room in the middle here. It's Helen's room. So both of them can go a secret uh, way to go out if anything happens to them. So now, Bob at the rooftop. They have another level on top. They call it Tower of Kelly Castle. In this segment, we visit a homemade noodle restaurant called Gopeng Lai Fun that's been in business since the 1970s. This is Lan Lai Fun. I started to in This is my Mobin 松媽愛真實材料,即係米又愛靚咯,唔係隨便買啲米啊,普通米咁開嚟整咯,樣樣都愛好味嘅,所以整到嗰啲味道就唔同咯。Chef Bob Adnan is a fan of Epo clay pot chicken rice. He shows us how to cook it. Hello guys, we meet again. Uh, I'm Chef Bob. It's most popular in Ipoh, in Perak. We call it claypot chicken rice or we call it Ipoh claypot chicken rice. But this time I want to twist a little bit uh, with my own style. I'm learning this one with the Hong Kong chef plus with this local chef from Negri Perak, Ipoh. Okay, the first step that we have to do for uh, Ipoh chicken rice, we need to have a chicken meat. So Bob using a chicken leg like this, but I have already deboned and then I cut it slice until making a cube like this. This one is ginger blend. Alright, you just uh, uh, blend the ginger, you just add it with a garlic chop here. We have to add soya sauce. Alright. Then Bob using oyster sauce. Okay. Together, dark soya sauce about three tablespoon dark soya sauce. This one we need to mix everything must be equal. Two tablespoon of sesame oil, one tablespoon of sugar. Mixing well, I have to put it 
a, a corn flour mixing it very well i really love to add a little bit of a garlic oil i just have to have to put a little bit actually it's no need to put but i really love a garlic oil i just put a tablespoon this is shiitake mushroom dry shiitake mushroom mix it well and rest in the fridge about at least two hours or you can put it in overnight do one technique like this shake it all over ginger here very thin slice just add three four slice and a spring onion i really love the spring onion i want the rice to be fried earlier so 300 gram of a rice that been cleaned earlier you don't want also the rice to stick together at the water a 300 gram the technique is 300 gram of a rice then we have to add the water about 500 ml like i said you also can cooking the rice as usual as normal so let it have about five minutes okay after five minutes and uh, you see all the smoke on going up so you open up you see the rice is already almost cooked uh, half cooked so you have to mix very gently slow down the fire then you add the one chicken that the one we are marinate earlier you just add on top mm. i love to add a little bit of the skin of the chicken uh, so it looks, looks more moist okay then the sauce you don't throw it just sprinkle on the, all over the top of the rice so we cover it again about another five to eight minutes all right let's see okay after about uh, six to seven minutes almost eight minutes now look at that the chicken and the rice Ooh, so get the garlic oil on top sprinkle with this the chili wow okay. so bob want to try Mm. Super delicious. Yummy. Try at home the recipe Ipo chicken rice. Bob style. Very nice. See you guys. Herat native and MOMC community member Michael Chong gives us his foodie suggestions for your next trip to Ipoh. Hello, I'm Michael Chong from Selangor, West Malaysia and I was born in Ipoh, Perak. Let me share with you some popular foodie places over there. First up, restaurant Ipoh Kong Heng for their Kai Si Ho Fan or shredded chicken in smooth rice noodle soup. Also try their Dan Dan or chilled silky egg caramel pudding. Make sure you drive up to restaurant Ong King Lim for yin kuk kai or salted baked chicken bursting with aromas of Chinese herb and smokiness. Also go to restaurant Chung Ki or Tai Shu Kyok Big Fruit Tree Restaurant for stuffed yong tau fu or stuffed fish paste with tofu and vegetables. Quench all your thirst and swash down that savory food with funny mountain soya bean curd or tau fu fa. Also drink their ice cold soya bean milk extracted to you on the spot. Satisfy all your snack cravings with Aina Dan Rangok, yummy and crunchy snacks at classic Malaysian Indian roasted nut shop with lentils, beans and crisps. Also get sesame peanut candy from Mayway Biscuits, freshly baked by the owner. Never leave Ipoh without stopping by Asai Fruits Trading for super big fresh pomelos from Tambun nearby Ipoh downloaded for you. I truly hope you can visit Malaysia someday and go to Ipoh Perak for their delicious food. It was great sharing with you. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Pulau Pangko is a popular resort island which is part of Perak and the home of a unique version of laksa. Here's how it's made. Oh, God.
dia dah garing sikit kita masukkan udang Our masters of Malaysian cuisine chefs Rene Jufri and Chef Joe answer the question: What dishes do you think of when you think of Perak? Hi everyone, Rene Johari here from Dubai. So talking about Perak, okay, it's quite unique. Uh, Perak dishes that I can uh, remind myself with is first is uh, white coffee, Ipoh white coffee, uh, chee chong fan, and then we have uh, laksa kuala, uh, rendang to. My favorite is rendang dendeng uh, and also kelamai. Uh, so if anyone wants to know about kelamai, so try and find in Perak. So all the best, enjoy Perak. I used to grow up in Nepal when I was uh, in the middle uh, school. So normally um, in in Perak, you normally in Ipoh mostly you can find uh, this uh, we call it salted chicken. So this salted chicken is very succulent and infused with the um, Chinese herbs. So the other one is uh, in Jelapang, I think. Uh, there is a nice uh, rojak stall, beautiful rojak stall. You can see a lot of people waiting there. And of course, um, you have to try the Ipoh, uh, famous uh, chicken rice, what they call it, um, bean sprout chicken. Yeah, bean sprout chicken. 
or the other one for the Malay one, maybe you can try laksa telur goreng bersarang. This is uh, quite nice also. But of course, for those coffee lover, don't forget you must try their Old Town White Coffee. So there you go, that's our little whirlwind tour of a pair up. Obviously not enough time to do it justice. So if you want access to our bonus content, make sure you sign up, okay? At malaysianchefs.com slash street food journeys and we'll add you to our mailing list and you'll get all the recipes and all the extra clips. Now, uh, don't forget to tune in again next week. We're covering Trungganu this time around and uh, have a great week ahead. I'm Jackie M. This episode of Street Food Journeys features Masters of Malaysian Cuisine Chef Rene Jufri making a popular Trunganu snack called Neck Butt Yours truly making a simplified Kropot Lekor The Jet Light Warriors Trunganu Food Trail Marco D's take on Kropot Lekor Ken Abroad tasting Trunganu food Shaokani Abbas with his rundown on places of interest in Trunganu and our MOMC and MOMC at Heart Chefs answer the question, what dishes do you think of when you think of Trunganu? Award-winning tour guide Shaokani Abbas joins us to talk about his list of must-visit places in Trunganu. Shaokani, great to have you and we are talking about Trunganu. Never been to Trunganu, so what should I look forward to? Well, this is a place you must visit, <laughs> Jackie. Okay. Anyway, Trunganu is on the eastern part of the peninsula of Malaysia. And the most important, one thing I love about Trunganu is the islands of, of the, in the South China Sea. And uh, among the islands which worth mentioning is Presentian Island, Rendang Island, you know, all these are uh, great place for diving, to dive to see the corals under the sea, swim among the turtles and the fish, colorful fish, you know, this is a very nice part of the Trangganu. How, how are the islands different? Are they all pretty much the same or like do each one have like different features? Well, every island have their own identity, but the most common part is the diving. Uh, that's, okay. That's, a, that's the best part of it. Okay, so uh, what time of the year would you go to Trunganu to visit the islands? Well, don't go in December or January, you know, these are the monsoon time, a lot of, okay. a lot of strong winds. But the best time is June, July, August, and that's the best time to go. Okay, great, great, sounds great. And what else would you do in Trunganu if you don't go to the islands? Well, to me, I would prefer to go and see the handicraft. Trangani is very rich in handicraft, especially songket and batik and brassware. I go there to buy my batik and songket, not in my hometown, but in, I go to Trangani. And beside the handicraft, the places of interest which I like to go to Trangani is to visit the biggest museum in Malaysia, Trangani Museum. Yeah, it's very big, huge. And also, so the the mosque there are several mosques there with beautiful architecture. I okay. should get some of the mosques there. Sure, sure. So with Trunganu Museum, is it like um, does it store like Trunganu specific artifacts or like from all of Malaysia? No, especially on Trunganu itself, and they okay. have uh, very good collections there. Okay. Especially oh, on the uh, hand, handicraft, the old handicraft, things are things very good. Sure, sure. Okay, interesting. Okay, now tell me about the food. What do you like about Trungano food? 
Alright, when I go to Tangadu, the first thing I will look for breakfast is nasi dagang. That's my favorite thing for nasi dagang. And for snacks, I usually for the fish crackers or the sata, you mean of fish and that, you know. And also kopot leko, uh, the like sausage, like you mean of fish, and you dip it chili sauce. And uh, the, the, for the lunch, I would prefer the nasi kerabu, where the rice is uh, blue in color because they use the uh, Uh, the to, to make it blue and uh, this is my favorite food whenever I go for Tranganu I will not miss this type of food there are more things there but um, I, these are the th- things I can I love the most okay I'm sure uh, yeah that sounds like a lot to keep us busy for a while in Tranganu okay. <laughs> <laughs> a lot, a lot. <laughs> but uh, some of the things there are very sweet and and okay. don't forget better visit the the market That's the best place to see the locals, how they, they, they sell the things and a lot of souvenirs there. The market in Pasar Payang in uh, Kuala Trangganu. Okay, Pasar Payang, Kuala Trangganu. Okay, great. I'm going to look it up. Thank you so much for this, uh, Michelle Khani. Okay, bye-bye. I'll see you later. Bye. The Jet Lag Warriors are a full-time travelling couple from Canada who spent quite a bit of time in Tranganu. Here's a look at their experience. Very excited. We're going to a place called Fauzi, which is like world famous if you're into Nasty Caribou. And it's already people lining up outside. Yeah, it's right across. Look at the lineup, guys. Wow, the lineup is serious. Well, it must be good food then. All right, let's go. Looks amazing. I'm nervous we did something wrong because the lineup is so long and it's moving so fast and it's so hectic at the front. I'm nervous we missed the gravy. I don't know if you guys saw our nasi dagging video, but we missed the gravy and everyone's commenting like, bro, how can you have nasi dagging with no gravy? Oh, no. So I think everything's here. What do we have here? We have this. I don't know what it is. This looks like a sausage almost. Maybe sausage, salted egg, piece of chicken. You've got this blue rice, which is amazing looking. Very not from food coloring which is what i was thinking it looks it looks a little bit fake and i'm sure it's not if it was food right. coloring it wouldn't be a famous dish it has to right. be natural right right and then you've got some veggies on top and some sambal on top yeah i mean the i'm veggies, excited the veggies are, looks very fresh it's called ulam i think looks fresh mm-hmm. everyone seems to be eating with their hands okay so i think the first step is to get a little mix going on here nice. you know don't be afraid matt sale with his hands i'm i'm uh i'm excited for this ivana Nice and warm on your hands here. Blue rice. Here we go. How is that? Oh, it's really fresh, Ivana. Wow. It's almost like eating a salad. This wow. is really good, Ivana. All it's right. really crispy. The, all the vegetables are really crunchy, and it's spicy. And the blue rice is just so beautiful, it makes it taste better. <laughs> MOMC's Rene Jufri is a Michelin-trained chef and Tranganu native. He shows us how to make an iconic Tranganu snack called neck butt. Hi, hello everyone. So, hope everyone is doing well. I'm Chef Rene. Welcome back to Masters of Malaysian Cuisine and Tourism Malaysia. Hi Jackie, hope everything is okay over there. So, today I'm uh, bringing a special dish from the east coast of Malaysia, Kuala Tranganu. So this dish is a sweet dish, all right? It's a dessert. It's called kueh neck bun. Let's start with the recipes and the ingredients. Um, yeah, Rene. So what are you making for us? Hi. Right, so today I'm gonna prepare a sweet dessert from uh, Terengganu, from the East Coast. It's called neck bun. Uh, it's called neck bun. So it's a sweet that's uh, quite common in uh, Terengganu itself. Okay, neck bun. Like, is it? Is that a Malay word or is it is it a Malay sweet or did it come from somewhere else? Yeah, it's it's uh, a very uh, Malay and uh, traditional in Tranganu. It's, it's from the accent itself, like but yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. So it doesn't actually mean anything. Like it's not a word. No, no. It's uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> I've never heard of it. I've never seen that before yet. Okay, I'm keen, I'm keen to find out what it's like. So let's have a look. Very straightforward. You have rice flour. 
All right. Eggs. Right now you have eggs, three eggs for the recipe. You have sugar. This is for and then that's for the nick but uh, dough, which is the, the cake like. And then you have after that you need to soak them. You have to once you prepare the nick but you have to soak the nick but with the uh, sugar syrup. So you have sugar, some uh, clove, and then we have some uh, pandan leaf and some water. So it's quite straightforward on in the ingredients. So what you need to do first is that the rice flour, we toast the rice flour a little bit on a pan, on a very low heat. Uh, just what does that actually do? I've never, I, I sometimes see the whole thing about toasting rice now. I've never yeah. done it. Okay. It's quite interesting that you get a crunch. Uh, if you make a biscuit, you get a, a bite to it. And also it's, um, the process is actually to dry up the, the flour. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Right. So next, uh, once you toast the flour, you just put it on the side. Now we're gonna just mix the eggs first with the eggs and the sugar. So almost like a uh, similar process, like you do a sponge, for example. So you wanna beat up the eggs and sugar to fluff it up. So it's okay. something like bahulu uh, or the sponge, right? So just beat the, the eggs and sugar until it's very fluffy. That you can see now it's very creamy. And okay. what you do next is to fold the rice flour little by little. You don't want to put everything together because uh, the thing is you already aerated the, the uh, eggs and uh, sugar, right? So that's the actual body for the neck bite. So it's um, once later on, you will see the texture. It's slightly similar to baulu, but it's more crunchier. It's a bit more drier, actually, drier and crunchier, yeah. Okay, now uh, with the whole folding thing, uh, do you have to do it in just one direction or because? Yeah, you, you can do one direction or only once and twice, that's it. You don't uh, do like a, a whole uh, beating process. Depend, yeah. depend okay, okay, sure. So now the mold, uh, what we do is just we line it a little bit of oil and heat it up in the oven for a while to get the temperature to warm the, the mold. That's the same yeah. mold that we use for uh, Kuijara. Okay, okay, yeah. Cool. So even uh, bahulu, you can have the same one as well. Yeah, yeah. Version, yeah. Okay. So once you spoon it up, uh, put it in the oven, one hundred eighty degrees until it's golden. It takes around around uh, eight to ten minutes. Okay. Minute. So you can see now when it's ready. When oh. you flip it, yeah, you get the the shape of the mold. So it doesn't mean uh, this particular mold by itself. You can always uh, opt it for a different mold, different shape. Uh, okay. Similar to the floor, like the baulu flower, is is also one of the option. And also, maybe you can try with the uh, the fish look like. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So now we're gonna it... prepare the syrup. Okay. Was the mold like, like, like a copper mold or what was it? Uh, that's a uh, yeah. That's actually a mix uh, copper brass. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Mix, yeah. So syrup and just two cloves. Now, yeah, we're making the syrup. So the, the syrup has an infuse of clove. Okay. That's what makes it unique as well. So just simple syrup, you have the sugar and water, bring it up to boil with the clove and pandan to infuse the flavor. Once it's ready, you drop the uh, neck bud, uh cake into it. Okay. So what it, it does now is that the cake kind of absorbs the syrup and right. makes it tender. Okay. Yeah. The difference with the... Like the, the syrup looks very thin. It's not like a thick syrupy. Yeah, it's it's not too uh, thick like a um, how would say not too like honey honey texture or syrup syrup thick texture. It's just okay. nice that uh, it's already sweet and uh, you just wanna probably reduce it one third. Oh, okay. The sugar itself, yeah. Oh, fascinating. Yeah. And you just eat it like this. Yeah. So once it's soaked, you just serve it as such. And uh, quite straightforward. The thing is, the difference with the dough, the cake itself, it's uh, more crunchy and more dry. Or the okay. That's why you have to soak it to make it uh, tender again. Yeah. Ah, right, right, right. That's very interesting. Yeah. I, I, I kind of expected it to be really soggy when you soak it like that. But it's not soggy when you eat it. It won't be too extremely soggy. So it's just, um, it's like, imagine a madeleine. Or a sponge cake, yeah. it's been lightly soaked uh, with syrup. That's it. Okay, okay. Yeah. Oh, interesting. I'll have to try that. Cool. Right here. Yeah. Well, thanks for that, Rene. I'm so fascinated by Trungano food. Never never been to Trungano, so I have no idea. <laughs> All yeah, right. Right, yeah.
<laughs> okay, cool. I'll see you later. Thanks again. Bye. Thank you. We are in Kamama and here we are. So this morning we had a very special breakfast at a restaurant called Tin Kim Leng restaurant that serves Kamaman specialty, the fish noodles. <laughs> just got used to eating rice for breakfast and now Ivana's got me eating fish for breakfast. Okay, we got the specialty from Kamaman. Fish noodles. It smells good, isn't it, Steve? Ooh. It smells so fishy. It smells fishy, but we'll try it. Look at the amount of sambal. So much sambal in there. Let's see, I've never... I don't know what type of fish this is, but let's see. Let's see if I like it. If I'm okay with it, Steve will be okay with it, hopefully. But it, I agree, it smells kind of fishy. I don't know if you're supposed to eat it just like this or with the noodles. It's okay, it's good. And I got charm, of course. A mix of coffee and tea. But here we are. It's pretty good so far. I like I like the fish. Let me just mix this. Ooh, so much sambal. Let me just taste the noodles. Hopefully my uh, chopstick skill is good. <laughs> mm. The noodles is good. Try it, Steve. Oh, I'm nervous to try, but uh... Come on, Steve. the problem is it's breakfast, man. You know, first meal of the day. You want to start off the day with something nice. <laughs> this looks good, actually. The soup and the noodles look really good. It is really good. In my head, I can taste fish in there. I know there's no fish in there, but because this is here, I ate that and I thought, oh, it tastes fishy. Uh, <laughs> it's all in my head, Imana. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's really good. It tastes good. Um, the soup is good, right? Yeah. I can taste some fish in there, even though there's not. This is so not me. You should put the chilies and lime on top of the fish. Just rip it open, no? Yes or no? You don't know? I don't know. If you don't know, I don't know, Ivana. Maybe no skin. Yeah, no skin is uh, it's safe. Play safe. Oh, you're eating it by itself. No lime, no chili, no noodles. Your face is okay. It's actually quite good. Really? Not fishy at all. Wow. Uh, this is good, Ivana. Good? Yeah, this is good. This is good. Awesome. I'll finish everything. Wow. Wow. I saw this fish on a plate. Just the way the fish is like this. I was like, oh, I don't want this, man. No, it's really good. In my head, I was having a phobia. I tell you what, overall, this has been a success. I thought I was going to eat some of this, not like it, and go somewhere else for breakfast. That's what I thought was going to happen today. This is good. I'll finish this. Yummy. Hear what YouTube and TikTok star Marco D has to say about Karapot Lekor. The Karapot Lekor. Now, I love this Karapot Lekor. It's just such a nice snack. Mwah. It's like really fishy. It's like really doughy. And I love all the doughy things. There's just one really famous place in Terragani where they have the Karapot Lekor. And I went there and they had all these different flavors, all these additions, and it's really good. Now, when I buy the Karapot Lekor, they always have this. And I don't know what it is. Um, I tried to Google, uh, but nothing came up. So tell me what this is. Fish stuff is really good as well. The carrot pop liqueur, I know, is really good. Carrot pop liqueur, I'm very sure.
Krapo Lekor is a well-loved fish sausage snack in Trangganu. In this segment, I show a simplified recipe you can try at home. So in this particular segment, I'm going to make a simplified version of crawpot lekor. Crawpot lekor usually is made using a uh, chopped mackerel, okay, like a dark, uh, firm fleshed fish. But uh, I'm just going to cheat completely and use basso fillets, which you can easily find in your local Australian supermarket in the freezer section. Okay, so basso fillets, we're going to mince it into a paste and I'm just seasoning it with uh, some pepper and a little bit of sugar because basso fillets tend to be quite bland and also you can add some salt and some chicken powder in here. Okay, so just blitzing it in my food processor briefly and we're going to transfer them into a stainless steel bowl. There's about a half kilo of basso fillet mince here and then what we're going to do is we're going to add about 50% of its weight in uh, starch. Okay, we're going to use tapioca starch, though typically you would use sago, sago flour, okay, sago starch. But you see how it's a very, very soft paste at the moment. Now, if you were using a firm fleshed fish, you would want to add some ice water in your food processor to blend it, okay, otherwise it'll be too dry. Uh, but because basso fillets tend to be very wet, uh, I haven't had to add any additional water to it. But now we want to add flour, uh, starch as much as you can to turn it into a soft dough. Okay, so it will start out really sticky and you're just going to add more starch to it to, uh, to the point where you can actually uh, form it into sausages. Okay, so these are called fish sausages translated into English. Now, what you want to do is actually cook them. Uh, so we're going to heat up some water, bring them to a boil in a saucepan. And we're going to add some uh, flour. I'm using, again, tapioca starch. You can use cornstarch or whatever else to help um, to form the, the fish sausages, okay, so they don't stick together. Um, so you want to shape them into sausage shapes. And then once the water comes to a boil, you just add it into the pot, okay? Now you're just going to make sure you don't, um, the sausages don't stick to the bottom of the pot. So just gently lift them up with a ladle if they do, okay? And then you're just going to simmer them for a minute or so, or a minute or two, till they float up to the surface and stay floating up. And once they do, you can take them out and just drain them. And just repeat the process with the rest of the fish. They're not going to look smooth like your typical uh, sausages, okay? They're going to look a little bit crinkly and a little bit rough and that's fine. Okay, so now what you want to do is actually deep fry them. I've just got some oil in that pot over there, in that uh, wok. And you want to heat it up to about 160, 170 degrees. And just make sure the sausages aren't still dripping wet. And just add them to the oil and fry them up. And you notice the color of these uh, fish sausages are like a creamy pale uh, color. But typically in Malaysia, the Kropot Leko, the because of the kind of fish they use, they will actually look great. Um, so it really depends on the kind of fish that you're using. And you just want to fry them up till they're a little bit aromatic, a little bit um, lightly toasted. And you're going to find when you fry them up that they will expand in the oil. But once they cool down, they'll shrink back up. And finally, you want to dip to go with it. You can just use a bottled chili sauce, bottled Malaysian chili sauce, so you can make your own dip. I'm using some blended uh, fresh chilies there. And just adding a little bit of tomato ketchup to it. You can add some water to it if it's too dry, okay? And I'm just uh, sweetening it up a bit with some sugar. And if it's too runny, then you can thicken it up with a little bit of a cornstarch or tapioca starch mixed with cold water to finish it off. And that's your chili dip. So pretty straightforward. Give it a shot and let me know how it turns out. Okay. Again, this is your simplified Aussie bite way to quickly put together a delicious snack. 
that's inspired by the Kropot Leko in Tunganu. Enjoy! Ken Abroad is a full-time traveller based in Southeast Asia. Let's check in on his experience of Tunganu food. <laughs> hey, I'm looking for Nazi Dagang. Oh, yeah. Nazi Dagang. This one. Yes. And uh, you put a tuna fish? Oh, yes. yes. Ah. Okay, I would like to try it. Nazi Dagang. <laughs> oh, we have the, the tuna fish that is still looking like a fish. What's that? Ah, okay. Or maybe I can get a, yeah, maybe let's get a fork or a spoon as well. Ah, okay. Terima kasih. Okay, how much? Three. Three winged. Okay. Three winged. Okay. Three, right? One, two. Okay, okay. 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 thank you. Okay. Right, three winged. 60 cents in euro. Sounds like a good deal for me. It's just rice with uh, some, uh, or a small piece of tuna fish. And some, uh, what is the name of these? I think it's not a regular cucumber, it's called something else in, in English, I think. And mix it a little bit inside the rice. Wow, oh, that's a huge peach of tuna fish. Mm. Wow. Wow. Nice flavor. Yeah, so I'm almost done. And I have to say, I really like it. It is a simple dish, just tuna fish, rice, and some cucumber, uh, and some onions, and maybe there's coconut inside, maybe not. <laughs> but it's a simple dish, but sometimes the simplest dishes, or the simplest dishes, are the best ones. Laksa Terengganu and normally the Peranakan community will have this. Mm. And it comes with lots of ulam mm. and some Peranakan kui. Very nice. nice. Alright, Laksa Terengganu. Wow, I think every state has its own laksa. So I don't know how different this will make. Let's try. I like it. It's so fresh with all the ulam. I like it. I like it, Steve. I asked our MOMC chefs, Johari Edris and Renee Jufri, and MOMC at Heart's Lisa Yeo, what dishes they think of when they think of Tranganu. Here are their answers. Renee Johari here. So, thinking of my favorite uh, dishes if I think about Kuala Tranganu. So, Kuala Terengganu, of course, is a coastal uh, east coast of Malaysia. It has a lot of seafood offerings. So, one of the favorite dish will be keropok leko. So, I think this is uh, everyone's favorite from Kuala Terengganu, and followed by nasi dagang. Okay, this is also a breakfast dish actually that is uh, a local favorite. And you have lo honko. So, lo honko is a dried mango steam, so which is uh, prepared into a broth and have it like a soup. So this is quite interesting from Trangano. And you have satar. Not forgetting pulut lepa and kuih kasida. Okay, so jalang-jalang makan Ganu kita. So enjoy Kuala Trangano. If you enter Trangano, normally uh, for breakfast, I would go for nasi dagang. Sometimes they call it nasi mi, also nasi minyak. And maybe for a, a snack, you can always go for fruit lepa, a very nice fruit lepa down there. And of course, for maybe uh, afternoon tea, you can always go for a coat manis or maybe a neck bite. And of course, don't forget to go to the seaside. You can find those a lot of those um, hawker style selling ICT, ikan celup tepung, that means uh, uh, fish dip in a better. And of course, if you go to Tengano, you must taste kropok leko, otherwise, you are not in Tengano. When I think of Trangano, definitely the first thing that comes into my mind has to be nasi dagang and my all-time 
favorite Kuropo in the whole wide world. Kuropo Liko. Oh my god, I like the I like the thin one, right? And it's so crispy and you have it with that chili sauce. I can die hoping I can eat it again. I wish I can eat it again. But I want to eat where, you know. Pulau Redang. Lie down at the beach. Santai. Masuk mulut. Makan keropok leko. After that, makan nasi dagang. That, I swear, is heaven on earth. <laughs> Well, I hope that's given you a little bit more of an idea of Tongano and its food. Uh, don't forget, if you want the recipes and all the bonus content we couldn't fit into this episode, you need to sign up, okay, at malaysianchefs.com slash streetfoodjourneys. And I'll see you back here next week. We're doing Penang. I'm Jackie M. Have a great week ahead. This episode of Street Food Journeys features How to make wonton mee by Liam Ghani How to cook oyster omelette with yours truly Places of interest in Penang with Shalkani Abbas Marco D on a flying visit to Penang for Cha Kui Diao and more Some of my favourite hawker places in Penang The Tropical Spice Garden and our MOMC chefs and my community members tell us about their favourite Penang food. Award-winning Malaysian tour guide Shaukani Abbas joins me to talk about Penang's destination highlights. Here's what he has to say. Hey Shaukani, good to see you again. Now, Penang, I have been to Penang, but I love your uh, tour guide's perspective on it. So tell us a little bit about it. Well, uh, Jackie, Penang is an island. It's located in the northern region of Peninsular Malaysia. And uh, if you fly there, it takes only one hour, or you drive there, it takes four hours. But you have to go through over the Penang Bridge. Uh, it's, it's an awesome bridge, it's a very long bridge. And uh, Whenever I go there with my group, we always check in. Then the first place we will go, we'll, we'll be visiting is the Penang Hill. Okay, it's around 821 meters above sea level, and uh, a trip you must not miss. Next to the hill, there's a temple. We call it Kek Lok Si Temple, the largest Buddhist temple in Southeast Asia. Right? I have to be there. Yeah, it's huge. It's yeah. like it sprawls, like it's crazy. Yeah. Mm. Then Penang, as you know, is a UNESCO heritage site together with Malacca. Uh, the heritage site he should visit too. But before that, he should visit the Chong Fat Zi Mansion. Okay. It represents uh, the best of the 18th and 19th century Chinese architecture. We also call it the blue mansion because the facade is indigo in color. As you know, Penang has a lot of clan house, right? So the biggest clan house in Penang is Ku Kung Si. And in the area too, you should go and visit Armenian Street. Yeah. And you can find souvenirs, whatever. That's the place. And also there's a lot of street arts and murals around that area. You should also visit Little India. During, during my, wherever I go there, I love the smell, the, the music, the color of Little India, as if you are in India. It's, it's a very special place there. Okay. This, okay. Yeah. And uh, a lot of spices too. <laughs> and also, 
uh, along in Little India, there's one street we call the Street of Harmony. All the world religion are there. Thank People, you so much for this. It's, yeah. it's a lot of things to do there. <laughs> I know, a lot of food to eat. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you okay. so much again, Chalkani. And I'll talk All to right. you next week. Bye. Okay, bye bye. TikTok star and TV presenter Marco D flew to Penang recently to eat char kway teow and oyster omelette. Let's take a look. So I'm in Penang. I have got my kway teow. I'm at Lorong Salamats, apparently one of the best places for char kway teow. I can't believe I've actually flew all the way here just to try kway teow. It looks very good. I'm excited. The lady said it was good. The difference between this kway teow and the one in KL is here we have like the Chinese sausage. And also these prawns. Look at those prawns. Alamak, gila, gila, walla way. Look at that prawn. That is a big prawn. In KL, the prawns, sangat kecil. Tapi sini, sangat besar. It's a bit less spicy than usual because Matsale cannot handle the spice. Hanang kway teow. Here we go. Okay, that was worth the fight. That's worth the fight. You know what? Is that charcoal taste? It's just so nice, like, you can taste like the kind of, the burning of the kway teow, and I've, I can't wait to try this prawn. Oh, wow. Mmm. Very good, very good. Why I love kway teow, right, it's just such a simple dish. You got like cockles, prawns, bean sprouts, really simple dish. It takes them like five minutes to make, but, the combination of all these things are just so magical in your mouth. I would probably say Kray Tiao is in my top three Malaysian dishes. Like, seriously, I have it so much. You know, Malaysia is famous for food. You've got to try all these things in different states. I've come here for Kray Tiao. I was really hungry, and it's damn good. Mm -hmm. So I just got back from Penang, I'm in KL now, I'm in my home and I just can't believe I flew all the way to Penang for the food. But you know what, it was so worth it, that Kway Tiao, whoa, sadap, that fried oyster, sangat sadap. The hawker stall at Excellent Cafe in Air Itam, Penang, serves my favourite Penang Cha Kway Tiao. Here's a peek at the chef in action. Okay. In this segment, I show you how to make a popular Penang hawker dish, oyster omelette or or chien at home. All right, in this particular segment, I'm going to show how I make a oyster omelette, the Penang version. There are a few different versions of oyster omelette, but this one is probably closest to the Penang version. And the ingredients are pretty straightforward. I've got some oysters over here. 
They're fairly large. The ones you might find in an oyster omelette typically might be a bit smaller, but in Australia, everything is super sized in Australia. Now, uh, you want eggs, omelette eggs, and you want some garlic, minced garlic. And I've got some garlic chives that I've chopped up. And I've got some coriander that we're going to use to sprinkle over the top. Now, as far as the seasoning, uh, this is probably the most important ingredient or the, the one that might be a little bit, um, you know, not something that you might readily have in your pantry depending on the kind of food that you cook. This is what's called minced preserved radish or choy bo in Cantonese. So, and we've got some pepper and some salt and uh, tapioca starch or potato starch. Okay, tapioca starch is something that you can find easily at Asian grocery stores and what you're going to do is you're going to create a starch with batter out of it. Um, usually in a, a, at Hawkers in Penang you might see them use cast iron, big cast iron pans, okay? So we're going to start heating it up. In the meantime, let's make some, uh, some of the starchy batter. So we're going to get some of this tapioca starch. We're going to make, uh, mix it with water to turn it into a batter. Okay, so tapioca starch and just cold water, not hot water. And if you're not using a non-stick pan, you would want to grease this with some oil first, okay? We're going to be using a fair bit of oil, by the way. I'm just going to add a little bit of salt, just give it a touch of a flavor. And what we're going to do is heating up. You want to drizzle this on here, okay? And remember, like I said, you're going to be using a fair bit of oil in this particular dish, okay? So don't freak out. So, here you go. And let's throw in the oil. I prefer to add the oil after I've put in the batter, but you can put it in before, especially if it's non-stick because um, otherwise it will stick, right? But I add the batter in after I put in the oil, just so I can swirl the batter around a little bit. Okay, so you're just gonna fry this. And then what you wanna do, you can throw in your chives now if you like. Crack the eggs in. Just using two eggs here. Just break up the eggs. And don't be shy with the oil. And you actually want to brown the eggs a bit, okay? Just, gonna just break up a little space here in the middle. Add more oil. Now, usually when people eat this, they think that the eggs need to be runny. It's not the eggs that are runny, it's the, it's the starchy mixture that gives it that runny, smooth texture in your mouth when you eat it. Okay, so the eggs do actually get quite browned in this dish, okay? Like I said, this is the Penang version, or as close to it as what I make. There are other versions that are crispy, that are completely crispy, which are really nice as well. Okay, so I've just put in the garlic in the middle. Let's uh, add the minced preserved radish. And if you don't have it, don't worry, just leave it out, okay? 
I'm gonna throw in the oysters. You want the oysters to not be overcooked, that's the main thing. Uh, a couple of dashes of fish sauce. You can add soy sauce too if you like. And sprinkle some pepper over it. Now, because of the minced preserve radish being quite salty, you don't want to get too crazy with the, oyster, with the fish sauce. Okay, I'm just going to turn off the heat. Throw a little bit more chives here. Give it some more color. And sprinkle it with some coriander and you serve it with some chili sauce. On the side here. Soft, okay. Give it a go, let me know how it turns out. Don't forget the recipes. Uh, if you sign up to malaysianchefs.com slash street food journeys we'll get the recipes out to you when they're ready okay thanks again Tosun Cafe is a famous old school Hainanese kopi diam located in an alleyway in Georgetown check out how they make their kaya toast Hello. Hello. How are you? Good. How are you? Yeah. Hi. Hi. What photo was in the Penang born MOMC at heart chef Liam Ghani, who blogs at themuddledpantry.com, shows us how to make wonton mi or wonton noodles with chicken char siu. Have a look. Hi, I'm Liam Ghani. I'm here to show you my favorite street food dish from my home state of Penang in Malaysia wonton mi dry. Oh, it's a classic, it's easy, you're gonna love it. So, we've got our wonton mi noodle flavorings. Very simple. Some light soy sauce, sweet soy sauce, so ketchup manis, a little bit of dark soy sauce, some sesame oil, some salt and white pepper, and a little bit of duck fat. If you are making a non-halal version, you can go ahead and use a little bit of pork lard instead. So, for our wonton mi toppings, we have some egg noodles. We've got some Chinese chives, or you can use spring onions instead. We have some Chinese greens. In this case, I'm using some bok choy. Uh, of course, we have the char siu. So I'm using a chicken char siu. I've used a chicken thigh, which I've marinated and cooked off in the oven until it's nice and charred. And also an essential condiment, we've got some green pickled chilies. So, for the last part of our noodle dish, the wontons, obviously you need wontons for wonton me. Our fillings, I'm using a bit of ground chicken thighs. Traditionally, you can use some ground pork, 
and you can even mix it in with a little bit of um, prawn meat if you would like to. Some more Chinese chives. Uh, seasoning's very simple, a little bit of salt and again a little bit of white pepper and we've got our wonton wrappers as well. And that's it. I'll be showing you how to make these in a second. Okay, to make our wontons. Very simple. We have our filling, our chick ground chicken. We just to that, we're just going to add our salt and our white pepper. There we go. I'm just going to cut up, sli finely slice our chives. Again, we're using garlic chives. There we go. Perfect, add that to our mix. We're just gonna give this a little bit of a blend. Again, very simple. You can make this a lot, you can add a lot of other flavors to this, but for one time me, if you want a authentic hawker store street food version, you wouldn't have a very fancy one time. So let's just get all that in there. Okay. Now, to make our wontons, there are a number of different ways you can make a wonton. I'm going to show you my favorite way. What you're going to need is a little bit of water just to moisten the edges. You take your wonton skin, okay, you just get a little bit of your mixture, not too much, about a walnut size piece, about that size. Put it in the center, get your two fingers and just paint the water over. Now watch carefully, you flip it over so it's a triangle and you push it down. Now there are a number of ways that you can do this. That would be your most simple one time. If you wanted to as well, you can pull it over like that and give it a little pinch. Again, keep your fingers a little moist and just fold that back over like that. So for our flavorings, very easy. We've got our serving bowl. We're just gonna add in all our sauces, any order you like. There we go. There we go. Oh. duck fat, and our salt and white pepper. That's it, good to go. Okay, so let's cook this. First things, your noodles, boiling water, in it goes. Two minutes, two minutes, three minutes, done. Whilst that's going, your little wontons that we made earlier, they're gonna go outside the basket, Again, a couple of minutes, done. You'll know when they're ready, when they float. I'm back. Right, we're ready, almost ready. Noodles getting nice and soft. Wontons starting to come to the top, floating, which means they're almost ready. So, just let's give our noodles a little bit of a mix. It's gonna pop in our greens quickly. We're just gonna blanch them don't want to overcook them. Okay, let's turn this up a bit. Are you ready for this? Okay, so let's just take that out. Ready to serve it up. Okay, our noodles. Nice and soft, ready, wontons floating. Just quickly blanched our Chinese greens. We're ready to serve it up. Serving up time. Nicely cooked noodles. Don't want to drain them too much. You want a little bit of the cooking liquid to go in it. Awesome. And then a little bit of a ladle. Let's just get a little bit of that cooking juice out just to wet the noodles a bit. Then I'm just going to mix that all together. There we are. Then let's get our Nice wontons out. Look at them. Oh, look at those wontons. Just gonna pop those to the side there. Get our lightly blanched greens out. Pop 
that over there. Check it out, coming together. A sliced char siu. I'm gonna pop that over the top. And lastly, our chives. There we go. Get those chives over it. And then, our pickled green chilies. They just pop on the side there. How good does this look? Come on. You gotta try it. I ate an amazing mama mee goreng and mee rebus in Burma Road. Here's a look at the hawker cooking his famous mee goreng. Penang's Tropical Spice Garden runs garden tours, night walks and cooking classes. Catherine Chua takes us on a tour of what's known as Asia's Hidden Eden. Welcome to Tropical Spice Garden. My name is Catherine Chua. And um, here at this project, uh, we've, we've sat on this beautiful piece of land now for 16, 17 years now. And we sit in a natural um, secondary rainforest of over five, walking, five acres of walking trails. So come, let me take you on a little journey through, my, through the gardens. We host um, a whole array of the best of Malaysian food, from Nyonya to Malay to Penang street food. And each guest gets walked through in a very hands-on experience with our panel of very experienced and passionate home chefs. So yeah, so every guest that comes in, they get, they get to enjoy harvesting some of the herbs from the spice gardens and they bring it in and they get to cook with it and just really experience the best of our Malaysian herbs through cooking.
We asked some of my Jackie M's Malaysian Street Food Kitchen community members the same question we ask of our MOMC chefs. What dishes do you think of when you think of Penang? Here are their answers. Hi everyone, Penang is a place that I call home and to me, it is the food paradise of Malaysia. It is well known for its ever famous street food and hawker centers and my personal favorites are Char Kway Teow, Asam Laksa, Hokkien Mee, Lobak, Penang White Curry Mee and not forgetting the Nasi Kanda. Penang is also famous for its Penang Nyonya food. This is a must try for anyone visiting Penang and the popular dishes are Curry Kapitan, Asam Fish, Acha Awa, Tamarind Prawns, Ota Ota, Juhu Cha, Chai Bui and the Peru Ikan. And not forgetting desserts. There are many local desserts in Penang but my personal favourite is the Penang Chendol. Do give this food a try when you visit Penang. Hi everyone, I'm Chen and I'm from Penang. My favourite Penang dishes are Nyonya Kois. My earliest memory of them are the Indian traders selling the Nyonya Kois in a big metal tray that they carry on their head or in a tricycle. Second item would be Asam Laksa. Thick rice noodle in a spicy fish broth soup with garnishes. Third item, Cha Kway Tiao. It's a stir fry of flat rice noodles and it must have the charred taste and the cockles are important for me as a main ingredient. And finally, Jundo. They are shaved ice in brown sugar and coconut milk syrup and it's just a delightful dessert on a hot sunny day. That's all. Bye! Our MOMC chefs Johari Edrus, Renee Jufri and Bob Artman answer the question, what dishes do you think of when you think of Penang? Penang cuisine reflect the um, Chinese, Nyonya, Malay, Indian and some of those ethnic mix of Malaysia but also some influences of the Thailand because we have just crossed the border. So especially famous for hawker's food and they are normally served as alfresco. So normally are strongly featured like noodles, spices and seafood. Of course Penang are famous for their nasi kanda. But if you have a chance to eat one local dish on your stay in Penang, may cha kui chao biri. So it's a truly delicious Penang food uh, specialty. So you may also eat you may also see it written as Cha Kui Tiao and have had time for the tourists to pronounce it. So welcome to Penang. Hi guys, I'm Chef Bob. When I was thinking uh, about Penang, definitely Nasi Kanda Sur. Uh, where to get the Nasi Kanda, the nice one? Uh, always I go to Nasi Kanda Brato ataupun Nasi Kanda Line Clear. So another one I like it, uh, Cha Kui Tiao. I always uh, went to uh, Cha Kui Tiao at Sungai Dua, Cha Kui Tiao, Telur Basuh. Nice one. Hot sizzling. Meow. Hi all, Rene Johari here. So, I'm going to share with you today a few of my dishes that I can think of when I think about Penang. Okay, so talking about Penang, uh, I've selected a few dishes that I really, really like when I talk about Penang. So, the first will be on my list will be Nasi Kanda. So, Nasi Kanda is a well-known dish uh, for Penang and you must queue for this Nasi Kanda. Alright, so the next will be the Tong Sui. Alright, next on the list will be the Buah Pala or the Pickle Nutmeg. So, this is a unique one if you talk about Penang. Alright, then not forgetting the Penang Cha Kui Tiao. Okay. Penang Hokkien Mee also and then the two types of rojak that's in Penang one is the Penang rojak with the black sauce and the second one will be the rojak pasembo which is with the peanut red sauce then not forgetting their best ice kacang alright in Penang and not forgetting again Chendo Penang Chendo so in Batu Feringgi so please Enjoy Penang, so enjoy my list that I shared. Travel to Penang. 
Well, as much as we would have loved to include everything we wanted to in this episode, we just could not fit them in. So make sure you sign up at malaysianchefs.com slash streetfoodjourneys and we'll add you to our mailing list and let you know once all the bonus content and the recipes are available for you to access for free. Um, and I'll see you back here next week for Kada. I hope you have a great week. I'm Jackie M. This episode of Street Food Journeys features Master Chef Malaysia judge and MOMC chef Johari Edrus makes a northern vermicelli soup known as Bihun Soup Utara. The jet lag warriors try Bihun Soup Utara and Rodi Chanai Sarang Burong. Yours truly makes Rodi Chanai Sarang Burong. Ken Abroad eats Gulai Batang Pisang in a river. Chao Kani Abbas gives us his rundown on places of interest in Kedah. And our community, including Malaysian diplomats abroad, our MOMC chefs and more, answer the question, what dishes do you think of when you think of Kedah? Where's my chicken? Go, 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 go. Hello, I! Wow, I'm on camera! Welcome to Kedah Darul Aman. A lot of things I want to tell you. A journey culinary to Kedah Darul Aman. Okay, let's sit down. I just got back from Paddy Field. Today is so hot lah. Okay, come. Sit down. Okay, let's talk about Kedah, yeah? Uh, of course, Kedah have lots and lots of uh, hawker's food, yeah? Especially, they make from rice flour because is uh, Kedah is a paddy field thing, yeah? And uh, the most popular uh, are Mi Soup Utara, or they call it uh, Bihun Soup Utara, yeah? How to prepare them? They use uh, kettle, kettle knuckles, uh, uh, kettle leg, and they take the knuckle meat and the, also the the, the knees of the kettle and uh, they make a beautiful stock out of it and the condiment the trimming from the kettle leg they make it as a condiment and of course they must go with a special chili sauce which is chili powder vinegar and soya ha ah, and if i go to Kedah, i must look for kuih talam made from rice flour and brown sugar all to die for so for those people who like to know about Kedah. Don't forget to watch this program, okay? And we will bring you all one or two or three or many, many more recipes from Kedah Street Food. Don't forget to watch us. I'm Chef Ismail. Welcome to Kedah Darul Aman. Award-winning Malaysian tour guide Shaukani Abbas joins us to talk about places of interest in Kedah. Let's hear what he has to say. Ciao, Kani. Good to see you again. Uh, I have never been to Kedah. Tell me all about it. Well, uh, Kedah is another state in the northern peninsula of uh, Malaysia. It's near the Thai border. But uh, Alustar is the capital of Kedah. And uh, the most attractive part of Kedah in, in Alustar, I mean, is the, the mosque. They call it Zahe Mosque. With its, five, with its five black dome, which is one of the top 10 most beautiful mosques in the world. Even if you have a good view of Alustar, you should go to Alustar uh, Tower, which is 165 meters high. And uh, away from Alustar, if you want to learn about the ecology of, of Malaysia, 
you should visit the Bujang Valley. Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting site. A, there's a museum there too. They are still digging. <laughs> They're still digging there. Or you need to have a cool atmosphere. Atmosphere is very cool. You should drive up to Mount Jerai. It is 1,217 meters and the second uh, highest peak in Kedah. As you know, it talk about food. Kedah is a rice bowl of Malaysia. Yeah? Yeah. They, have, they have a paddy museum. Yeah? Nothing to do with the Irishman, paddy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this, and this museum is dedicated to rice plant, paddy, which is the world's most important crop. The jewel of Kedah is Pulau Langkawi or Langkawi Island. Yeah? I have been there many, many times and have, I have counted but the place of interest is 21 place to visit in, in Langkawi. There's a lot to visit yeah. in Langkawi. Yeah, either you love it or you hate it, but it's around <laughs> 21 place of interest. And uh, one thing I like about Langkawi is the fabulous beach they have there, among the best in Malaysia. A lot of hotels there along the beachfront. Then we can have, you can do island hopping. Yeah, visit the island hopping, or you spend a day snorkeling or diving at Pulau Paya Marine Park. Yeah, you can find you can you can swim among the the the, the fishes there with turtles, yeah, everything. And then the nature attraction of La Langkawi is the mangrove river cruise. It's a boat cruise through Langkawi Geopark Forest Reserve. It's, it's fantastic there. Right, these are the things we can uh, can do in Kedah. Okay, okay. Fantastic. I never realized that much. There was that much to do in Kedah. I always thought it was just Langkawi. You spend a few days at the resort and that's it, you know? But oh, this yeah. is fascinating. Yeah, that's why people uh, don't look at Alusta, they go for Langkawi. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll have to check it out. Well, thank you yep. again so much, uh, Shaokani. We'll talk to you All again right. next destination. Okay. okay. Right. Ciao. Well. <laughs>
No, sorry, same. We just take the bottom part. And there you are. Everything there. Lemon grass. So what you do, you just... You throw it and we put it here. Add up water. As you can see, we just fill up just to cover the bone and the meat. And we let it boil until it becomes soft. It will take about one or two hours. Okay, next what you need to do is just boil the water and you add the turmeric powder. Vermicelli, yeah? You just boil the vermicelli until it's... Later on, the vermicelli will soak all those yellow color. Okay, now you can see the uh, vermicelli already soft. There are two ways to do it. You can first soak your vermicelli uh, for a couple of hours or you can do the way that I'm doing now. Actually, I'm boiling it. We're going to pass it through the cold water so so you can cool and wait for until serving time. Pass through the cold water. Noodle will not be continue cooking. Next one is the red sauce. Sauce Mira. Cooking oil. We have cooking oil. The uh, pounded garlic and onion. Saute until it becomes nice and uh, fragrant. The chili. Chili paste. Uh, chili sauce. Chili powder. We just the uh, tamarind juice, some sugar. Then the sauce should be slightly on the sweet part. Add a bit uh, slightly water. Okay, guys, you can see now the soup are bubbling and the beef are already soft. It's already about uh, two and a half hours uh, been boiling here. The uh, pickle radish have to soak in the hot water for a couple of minutes just to release all the saltiness of this uh, the uh, the radish. So what you do, you just cut it. Uh, Celery, cut half of this to hold it firmly. Uh, okay, now the uh, spring onion. Okay, next one, of course, the beef. So soft. Okay, now you can see the soup bubbling hot. You can see the bowl, yeah. So now we are ready for serving. So we just take a handful of noodles. So we put it aside here in the bowl. And then what we do, we have this uh, beef. Earlier that we cut, the salted radish, we have the celery, spring onion, top up with the soup or the broth. It's worth waiting for a few hours for this lovely um, soup. Yeah. Now next what we do, we have this lime for the garnish. Lime here, fried shallot, the sambal merah to be by the side. Wow! Okay guys, that is Mihun Soup Utara. The most delicious, the most yummy, and the most flavorful dish in Kedah. You got to try it. And you got to try this recipe. Here is another uh, Mihun Soup Utara stall here. So you can see a lot of things there. This is the tribe, noodles, the um, meats, and so on here. As you can see here, they have a big pot with a pool of stocks and it is uh, for the meats. Uh, uh, soup utara. Okay. As you can see, uh, there's a lot of those meat, uh, there's a sauce here, let's try. Mm. Spicy and sweet. Very good. Don't forget to subscribe to MOMC for more recipes and future MOMC TV. So until next time, see you guys. Jumpa lagi. Hello, uh, Masters of Malaysian Cuisine. Uh, I'm Said Wafa from Kuala Lumpur. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, when I think of Kedah, uh, I think of my past when I was uh, studying in MRSM Perlis. So I'm not sure if it's a Kedah Perlis thing, but I miss having uh, Laksa Kedah or Mee Kuah uh, of the North. So do let me know.
Canadian couple, the jet lag warriors, visited Kedah during their year-long stay in Malaysia. They had the opportunity to try different Kedah dishes, including bihun suputara and roti canai sarang burung, a roti shaped like a bird's nest. Let's find out what they thought. Stopping in for some local specialties, bihun soup and nasi daging. What could be better than that? So everywhere you look, good food in Malaysia. What can you say? So stay tuned. Ooh, it looks good and actually it smells amazing. I'm telling you, the best food in Malaysia is always at a place like this where there's a roof and no walls. Yeah. <laughs> if there's no walls in the building and it's full of locals, that's the best food you're gonna that's get. That's Actually, to level this place up, if the vertical pillars are made of sticks, <laughs> those are the best places to get food. Yes. Roadside, no walls, local eats. That's true, and we're about to try nasi daging and bihun soup to of the most recommended food by you guys in Kedah. So. Kedah specialties, I'm hungry. Very excited to And I'm try. excited because of the uh, structure here. I know the food's good. <laughs> Bihun soup daging. I'm gonna go ahead and take all this chili, not even taste it, not even test it, and just dump it in. <laughs> Could be regrettable, we'll see. Looks really good. Look at all the meat, by the way. Full of meat, you got bihun in there. Smells incredible. This is comfort food. Wow, this is good. I'm already Ooh, thinking this is very so good. good. It smells very good. Mm -hmm. Wow. How's it? Uh, very spicy. <laughs> because you dropped the whole thing, mm. the whole chili. It's really good. It reminds me of, oh, you know what it reminds me of? Oh, it's so good. It reminds me of the soup parut in Tanameda. Oh, yeah. The greatest restaurant in all of Malaysia, Kampung Orang Warung. Yeah, Warung Orang Kampung. Uh, restaurant village people. This is really good. The meat is really good too. Mm. The chili is questionable. That many chilies. But special thanks to everybody recommending this. It's good. Yeah. This is comfort Ooh. food. If you're ever feeling homesick or lonely or, you know, after a bad breakup, you come for some <laughs> hot and spicy bihun soup. Not ice cream. No. In Malaysia, you go for this. Good morning, everybody. Here we are in Kadah. Now, check this out. This is not your average roti chanai. It starts off similar to what you might expect. And then you see him making these rings with the roti. <laughs> And then the eggs come out. Look at this. It's called bird nest roti. Come on, pretty special. Oh. I'm guessing. And then he tops it off with daging and potato curry. Oh, I am excited so to try this. I think the roti chana is just a regular roti chana with eggs. So let me get a big piece. Let me get this really oh, beautiful look looking the egg. cooked eggs. Half boiled, half cooked, I mean. Oh, wow. With some meat and potatoes <laughs> and some down soup. Here you have oh, it. That's a breakfast right there. <laughs> mm. The best kind of roti chanai. Really? Mm -hmm. You would say it's better than normal roti chanai? Mm -hmm. Wow. The best. That's really saying something because roti chanai is pretty good. Mm. Really good. I almost thought it looks like a Spanish breakfast, but it's Malaysian. Malaysian. Really nice. Just when you thought you've eaten it all, they Even, bring out roti yeah. chanai bird nest. It's like dugging in a curry soup and the curry is really nice too, not too spicy. Curry tasty. Awesome. Okay, Five stars. Five stars. Good one, good one. Look at this, guys. Look at the eggs still jiggling in there. Half cooked. The perfect level of cookedness. I think, I think the guy cooking it 
I think he's done this before. He did a <laughs> masterful so. job. Now I feel like roti chennai is finger food, but I'm gonna use fork and knife because this is a sloppy one. Yeah, this one is a messy one, so oh, fork and knife. Oh, it's so good. Oh, the, the egg yes. is just perfectly cooked. <laughs> the egg is perfectly cooked. And you love the runny egg. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. I guess you're gonna make one whole video about kida food. The best, right? Amazing that they have improved roti chennai. Better. That's Cannot why it's so fire. It. Cannot believe it. It's viral. Um, I could go for one more of this. I'm not sure if we're gonna have Honestly, time. Honestly, if I open a restaurant in Canada, this would be on it the menu. It has to be. It's so good, guys. It's warm. It's delicious. You got meat. You got potato. You got runny egg, and you got roti chennai, and it it's just amazing. Hi, my name is Didi and I'm originally from Penang, but I lived in Kedah for several years. Um, the first one is Pakasam, um, deep fried and eaten simply with just white rice. It's fantastic. And the next one is Pau Sambal Bilis, which are fried buns and they're stuffed with spicy anchovies and just freshly sliced cucumbers. The third is probably, um, I would say my favorite is Kue Dangai and they are these unique shaped morsels. They're made with sticky rice flour and grated coconut and the taste of toasty coconut on the outside of it will just captivate you. And the last one that I would share is Kue Peneram. It's these little mini donut shaped Kue that are made from rice flour and brown sugar and the, it tastes like these little insanely delicious nuggets of brown molasses. So these are a few things that I really love eating while I was in Kedah. Thank you! I was intrigued by the roti chanai sarang burung or bird's nest roti chanai that the jet lag warriors tried in Kedah, so I decided to make it. Here's my version of roti chanai sarang burung. Hi guys, so what we're going to do is make the uh, the bird's nest roti chanai. First of all, we need to make the roti chanai, the bread itself, okay, uh, or, or the dough at least anyway. So this is what you want to do. Uh, just pretend it is a dough mixer. You can uh, just using a thermomix, but obviously any dough mixer, or you can even knead this by hand. I've got some flour in here. I'm gonna add a little bit of salt, and I'm gonna add a little bit of ghee or even just oil, and I'm gonna add a little bit of condensed milk, or you can use sugar, or you can leave it out altogether. We're gonna add some water, and then we're just gonna knead this. I'm going to knead this for 3 minutes, let it rest for 5 minutes, and knead it again for 3 minutes, okay? Okay, so the dough has kneaded for 3 minutes on, 5 minutes off, and 3 minutes on again, so a total of 6 minutes of kneading. This is what it looks like now. What we want to do is to make them into dough balls, okay? So I want a dough that's pretty soft and easy to handle. And for this here, I'm going to divide it into four portions. And then, with each of them, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just tuck them in, okay? Let's get rid of all the creases. That's what I get here. And do the same with the others. Okay, now I want to grease them. And you can use oil, you can use butter, you can use ghee. And I'm using ghee here. Coat it generously. And then you're going to let it rest for at least a couple of hours at room temperature. If it's winter, like here it is, like it is here in Australia, just let it rest for a bit longer or stick it in like a, at a bread proofing temperature, okay, in your oven so that it doesn't get cold and get hard, okay? Rest for at least two hours and then we'll come back to it. So I've got the dough ready and I got some eggs and I've got some ghee and we're going to flip the dough and then we're gonna uh, cook it up with the uh, eggs in the middle and top it up with some curry that I've got as well that I'm going to add to it. Okay, let's have a go. So here's the dough and you want to flatten it and flip it. Okay, 
It's quite firm because it's cold. I prefer to work it when it's at room temperature or tropical room temperature. It just means it's a little bit harder to flip, okay? So to flip it, you want to flatten it and thin down in particular the edges, okay? So let's do this. And you just want to do a figure eight and flip and stretch and flip and stretch. And you just keep doing it till it's really, really thin. Now, if you're having trouble flipping it, you can just stretch it by hand. Okay, so again, really, really thin. And now, usually I would just fold it up and cook it, okay? But you want to make it into a rope this time around. I'm going to stick lots of ghee around it. Fold it up into a rope okay and then we're gonna turn it into a circle let's cook it up and let's just turn this on and get this nice and hot let's add some ghee to this okay so we're gonna cook this on low to medium heat and what i'm going to do is i'm going to put a lid on it just so that it can cook evenly okay because there's so many layers with the rope you want to make sure that they cook through properly and they don't end up burning on the bottom but still be raw in the middle you know and let's have a look cool. just gonna add a little bit more ghee so help it along Let's crack the eggs in. I'm going to cook it on low heat so it doesn't burn on the bottom too easily. And I've got some curry here that I made previously. This is a lamb and potato curry, but it's drier than the version that you saw in the video, okay? Okay, cool. Let's show in the curry. I don't go too crazy with it. Just cover it to finish it off. A bit more ghee. Break it up. There you go. Enjoy. Malaysian diplomats Cairo Tazril, the Chaje Dafe to Serbia, and Kartini Tajo, the education attaché to Australia, tell us about their favorite Kadar dishes. Dobar dan. Greetings from Belgrade, Serbia. Thanks, Jackie, for having me. Well, uh, when I think of Kadar, a place where I frequently go back to because uh, my dad is from Kadar, first thing first is Laksa Kadar. You can get anywhere in Kedah Laksa Kedah, but the one that I always look forward to when I go back to Kedah is the one prepared by my family back in Kedah. Uh, next in the list would be Chok Penram, you know, or Telinga Hindu. It is made of uh, tepung beras and gula merah. Uh, again, you can get anywhere in Kedah, but uh, the one that I like the most is the one prepared by my uncle's family. Uh, then, uh, Baulu, 
kuih baulu that you can easily get from Pasar Pekan Rabu. And last but not least is pekasam. It is fish or beef. Well, it's the best. It's always a uh, pembuka selera makan dengan nasi panas. Well, I think that's all. Ciao. Hi, I am Kartini Tajul, Education Attache at Consulate of Malaysia, Sydney. I am originally from Sungai Petani Kedah. Saya asal orang Kedah, orang Sungai Petani. Babak semua orang Kedah. My favourite food from Kedah. Uh, okay, yang pertama saya suka pulut nyok makan dengan ikan kering. The first dish that I uh, love. Uh, steamed glutinous rice, I will have that with um, desiccated coconut and uh, fried dried fish. Saya suka juga kalau menyorok pagi tu, saya suka pegna makan dengan gulai ikan. My second favourite dish, uh, like a savoury pancake. I love to have the pancake uh, with fish curry. Okay, semua saya ada pesanan untuk semua, uh, especially orang-orang Kedah. Jaga diri, stay at home, duduk rumah, kalau tak perlu, jangan keluar. InsyaAllah, semoga semua dipermudahkan. Thank you. Bye. Full-time German traveller Ken Abroad was invited to try a famous Kedah dish, gulai batang pisang or banana stem curry, at a lunch set in a river. Let's check in on his experience. You probably had a dinner before by the river, but did you ever had a dinner in the river? That is what we are going to do here now. So you can see they are sitting inside the river. Hello! Apa Bye! Bye! <laughs> All right, enjoy your meal! <laughs> so we are going to do the same here now. We are still on the trip with the Kedah Tourism Office. We are somewhere deep inside Kedah, Kedah State. And yeah, we are going to have the same here now. Let's see how that is. Okay. This is our menu today. Special menu for you. We have uh, this one is we call that a gulai batang pisang. Banana flower. Stock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where you cook it in. Yeah. You cook it in a banana stock. Together with meat. No, I think it is banana stock. You're gonna eat banana stock. Uh, but we are not Together eating. Beef, right? We're not eating Together bananas. No, There's no banana beef. pieces inside. I don't think so. Okay. Well, but I'm excited. Looks pretty good. Okay. This is a very uh, popular uh, here. Okay, okay. All right. I'm finished with my plate, which I'm going to show you fully when I made it down there. I forgot the names already. So what was this with pisang? Pisang. Gulai daging batang pisang. Gulai daging batang pisang. You want pakasam? Pakasam? What is pakasam? Pakasam. The fermented fish from Kedah? Oh, the fermented fish? Yeah. Oh, I'm okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I tried that at the, the Raya Hotel. All right, I'm first going to try the beef. Do we have bones in the beef? No. No bones? No bones. Okay, that makes it easier to eat. Oh, it's super soft. Super soft. Wow. Oh, by the way, I'm the only one here eating with a with fork. Everybody else is eating with their hands. Oh, well, maybe I should do that too. But okay. Mm. Mm. Wow. The beef is a good start. Mm. Wow. I mean, isn't this beautiful here? Look at the scenery behind us. Like, uh, is it like in the middle of the jungle kind of thing here? I mean, it's not deep in the jungle, but it's the jungle around us. Yeah. Mm? And then we have kids playing over there, the sun is shining, what an awesome place to have lunch. Mm. Wow, oh, this is awesome. What is this again? Um, mm. Banana stock. It's a banana stock? Yeah. Wow, this is really nice. Wow. Mm. Okay, so all in all, really nice meal. We're going to enjoy this now. Everybody happy? Yes. Sit up. Yeah. All right, Makan is finished and now the hands were pretty oily, but he just showed us a nice technique how to get rid of the oil on the hands. Okay, just grab some of the sand, now rub it to your hand and the oil is going to come out from your hand. Oh, yeah, the same technique that they use in the, in the workshop, yeah. when they are oil spill, they put the sand on it. Yeah, so that actually worked. So 
You just took some sand here and rub it. Oh, huh, works, right? Yeah. Pretty good. Our MOMC chefs Bob Atnan and Rene Jufri and MOMC at Hearts Su Wen Ui answer the question, what dishes do you think of when you think of Kedah? Hi, I'm Chef Bob. Mm, when talking about Kedah food, definitely in my mind straight away, uh, we think about Laksa Kedah. Where to get the Laksa Kedah? At the Laksa uh, Teluk Kecai. And Jalan, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in Jalan Ahmad Abdullah or something like that. Oh, so they have a, a Laksa Kedah there. They serve with one pieces of uh, fish. Oh, very nice one. That one you need to find it when you uh, go to Kedah Darul Aman. And then also, definitely, uh, just three days ago, I just having uh, Bihun Soup Utara. And also last one, definitely ikan pekasam. Ah, ikan pekasam this one is very special. Uh, we made from a freshwater uh, uh, fish. Uh, so we marinate them, we fermented them uh, about, about a week with the rice and then also salt and then also dry uh, uh, tamarind. Served with uh, steamed hot rice. Wonderful. Kedah, don't forget. Hi, Rene Johari here. So today we'll be talking about the destination called Rice Bowl of Malaysia, Kedah in the north. Okay, so all the rice throughout Malaysia comes from Kedah. Okay, so uh, I would say the least of my favorite uh, that I would like to share with you when I talk about Kedah, uh, most of it are using rice-based ingredients. So the first on the list would be Laksa Kedah. Okay, Laksa Kedah, it's uh, very known uh, when you talk about Kedah where the noodle is prepared from rice, rice base. Then second on the list will be ikan pekasam or pekasam fish. So this fish is fermented using rice. So talking about rice bowl of Malaysia, they really make use of their local produce. So next on the list will be dodol. Dodol is my personal favorite and obviously people from North, from Kedah, they really, really talk uh, about dodol. Then, you have also kueh karas. Okay, kueh karas is a tea time favorite in the north in Kedah that everyone must try. Then you also have tapai. Tapai, I would say, is a must try if you talk about Kedah. Also using their local produce, which is their glutinous rice. It's a fermented glutinous rice. Then a savory dish that always near to my heart when I talk about Kedah will be gulai nangka or uh, jackfruit curry. So those all are the lists that I can share with you today uh, regards to Kedah favorites. Apa kabar? Tatia Hao. Saya Su and Ui. I'm from Melbourne with love. When I think about Kedah food, I think about Nasi Kandah, number one. Best in the whole wide world. Laksa Kedah. Mmm, sedap. When you think about Chinese food, you go to the Esplanade, which is called Hai Tao Ki, which is near the Kedah River. You get Cha Kui Tiao, you've got Kon Lo Mi, you've got Ying Yong, you've got Popia, you've got Oyster Omelette, and the whole works in one whole building. So it's the street food, you're talking about street food. Love you all, miss you Kedah. Well, I hope you enjoyed our little virtual tour of Kedah and its food. Don't forget to tune in next week for the last in this series. This time we're visiting Borneo and the state of Sarawak. I look forward to your company then. Have a great week ahead. I'm Jackie M.
This episode of Street Food Journeys features an interview by Astro Malaysia, one of the people behind Sarawak Eatery Kedai Kamik about Laksa Sarawak. Masters of Malaysian Cuisine's vegan chef Dave shows us how to make a vegan version of Laksa Sarawak. Yours truly makes tomato kwetiau Sarawak, a tomato sauce based fried noodle dish. Shaukani Abbas with places to visit in Sarawak. The jet lag warriors try Sarawak food. Emma Simons visits an Iban longhouse and tries some exotic Sarawak dishes. And our MOMC chefs and community members answer the question What dishes do you think of when you think of Sarawak? Award winning Malaysian tour guide Shaukani Abbas has spent decades taking tour groups around different parts of Malaysia. He joins us to talk about some of the places we absolutely should visit when in Sarawak. Shaukani, great to have you back. How are you? Hey, fine, thank you. So tell me about Sarawak. You know, I was only in Kuching and I was only there for three days, so I didn't see a lot of Sarawak at all. So tell me uh, what it's like and where we should go. Okay, Jackie, I, I have compiled a short list of Sarawak attractions based on my experience traveling in this part of Sarawak. And Sarawak is located on the island of Borneo. It's the largest state in Malaysia with an area of 1,000 1, square kilometer, but their population is very small, around 2.5 million people. But uh, it's made up of a multicultural mix of 27 ethnic group. Is it 27 is quite interesting. Yeah. Wow. And uh, if you go there, you can visit them. All kinds of food they are, they are cooking there. All right. And um, tourist attraction not only can be found in Kuching, it also can be found in other towns in Sarawak, like Miri, Cebu, and Buntulu. All right. But in Kuching, you should follow the Kuching Heritage Trail. Yeah. Among the attractions that you visit and see are Fort. Margareta, yeah, today house uh, Brook Museum, constructed in 1878 by Charles Brook, the second Raja of Sarawak. Then, not to be missed, Sarawak State Museum. Or you can just experience to cross the Sarawak River by the ferry called Tambang Boat, something like a gondola. <laughs> it's very, very interesting. And uh, in the evening, you can. In the, you can visit the waterfront, right? For if evening stroll with uh, many eateries there, a lot of stalls there, and a good city view, and or you can cross the Sarawak River via the Darul Hanna Bridge, a Kuching landmark, which is S-shaped footbridge, right? So this is a very interesting. You can do that, but although there's a lot of things there, but this is recommended, okay? Or you can go outskirts of Kuching. A must visit is a Sarawak culture village, a 40 minute drive from Kuching. It is a living museum where you can encounter all the ethnic groups in Sarawak. If you like wildlife, go to Semenggo Wildlife Center. It's a rehab center for wildlife, especially the orangutan. Yeah? It's a home to the colony of semi wild orangutan who are trained and used to human encounter. They spend most of their time roaming in the forest, but are trained to get back to the center during feeding time. You can go to Miri, another town, to fly there or drive there to visit the Gunung Mulu National Park, uh, which is number one attraction of Sarawak. Uh, it is UNESCO heritage site, which include the world biggest chamber there. The Humongously big, big, biggest ch cave chamber. Oh, right. oh, okay. Okay, very, sure. Yeah, interesting. And then and near there, there's Nia National Park with the biggest cave entrance in Borneo. Yep. That exists over 40,000 years of human settlement there. They found uh, paintings of, uh, it's old painting that exists 40,000 years ago. And um, it offers jungle walk, Iban longhouse there, and cave experience. So these are the things you should consider if you happen to be in Sarawak. 
There's a lot of things there. All right. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much for this, uh, Shao Kani. Good to see you okay. as well. Okay. Okay. Bye. Okay. See you later. Ciao. Sharina Kushairi Kushna, who's from the Malaysian Diplomatic Corps in Germany, tells us what she thinks of when she thinks of Sarawak food. Hello everyone. Hi. Hello from Frankfurt, Germany. My name is Sharina and I've been residing in Frankfurt for almost three years with my husband, Awang Hafifuddin, who's attached to the Malaysian consulate and our 22 months old son, Aiden. Both my husband and I are Sarawakians, so we hold very, very closely to our heritage and culture and we try to bring it everywhere we go, especially in the form of its food. We would both agree that our ultimate favourite and the thing that we miss most would be our own Laksa Sarawak. We remember growing up, looking forward to our weekends just to have our laksa sarawak breakfast and that sort of binds the whole family together we watch people from all races enjoy their laksa sarawak and that just shows just demonstrates how united we are through our laksa sarawak actually so gradually when we moved over to putrajaya we hosted our families and friends and served laksa sarawak and it became everyone's favorite too and eventually when we came here we have also served it to our fellow malaysians over here and also to our international guests from elsewhere also another thing that i'd like to highlight that would be my favorite and i miss most would be our cake lapis uh, or layer cakes. Honestly, it feels a bit inadequate celebrating Hari Raya, especially without the presence of the vibrant and colorful cake lapis on your table spread. It just shows how artistic and how creative the Sarawakians can be and, 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 and how cake lapis has evolved over the years. It's just amazing with new colors and new flavors and even new trending names. I hope MOMC, together with everyone else all around the world, would continue on promoting Malaysia and also it food um, wherever you are uh, and put Malaysia in the world map um, more significantly. Thank you. Vegan Chef Dave is one of the founding members of Masters of Malaysian Cuisine and he's on a mission to create vegan versions of Malaysia's popular hawker dishes. Here he shows us how to make vegan laksa sarawak including the laksa paste. Hi guys, Wanakam, Salam Sejahtera, Tati Ahau. I'm Chef Dave from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. I'm a vegan chef, so today I want to do a vegan version of Sarawak Laksa. Actually, I born in Cebu, Sarawak, so I feel there's some connection with Sarawak. And so today I want to share with you guys how to make that Sarawak Laksa. Hope you guys will enjoy that. So for making Sarawak Laksa, actually there are a few things that we have to... Uh, take into concern so the first thing is uh, we have to make the paste for the sarawak laksa so when you're making paste you can make uh, in a large uh, batch and then keep in your refrigerator and freeze them or you know chill them and can use for the future but if let's say you just want to make a small portion it's still up to you you can make it and the ingredient basically you can get everywhere you are you know like in different part of the world you're still able to get all these ingredients so let's see for making the paste, uh, we have uh, fresh uh, ingredient as well as the dry ingredient. So for the dry ingredient, uh, we have to dry toast them in a pan and then we have to grind them into powder. So I have ground nut here, I have sesame seed and then I have fennel seed, I have cumin, I have coriander seed. Okay, so all these are one teaspoon and both of this is about two tablespoon or three tablespoon like that will do okay and the fresh ingredient we have here is uh we have some red onion we have some chili we have some galangal we have some uh, lemongrass as well as garlic and a bit of about one one and a half inch of vegetarian belachan okay belachan basically is a, a shrimp paste uh, but it's a vegan version so it's made from fermented soybean okay but this fermented soybean uh, they make into a paste so it smells like blood chan. so if let's say you couldn't get a uh, vegan or vegetarian blood chan in where you are living in you can use vegetarian oyster sauce or else you still cannot get vegetarian oyster sauce you can use dried shiitake mushroom make them into powder you can add them about one teaspoon will do is the function of it is just to give you some umami into your vegan version of sarawak laksa okay so let's we do the first part okay so for dry toast i just on uh so just use a pan 
so first thing first i will put in the peanuts first because it's bigger in size and will take some time to toast it so just make sure you toast it evenly so once it's halfway done we can add in the rest of the things like uh, cumin seed fennel seed as well as the coriander seed and as well as the sesame seed okay and then just keep uh, dry toast them together until it's a bit uh, like golden brown then you can just stop them and transfer them into a bowl okay after a while you guys will see it start to become a bit golden brown so now it's time to off the fire and then immediately transfer them into a pan or a bowl so that the heat from the pan doesn't continue cooking them okay so just let it to cool down okay now you can add in all these uh fresh ingredients that you want to grind them into paste so the chilies garlic galangal and um the vegetarian blachan onion and also the candle nut everything just go into a blender instead of adding water just use some oil okay just use about half cup of oil to blend this together okay now we can blend the dry ingredient once it's cooled down okay once we blend like this we can just put it in a bowl first okay guys so once our uh fresh ingredient already grind into a paste and also the powder also done so we can start making so just turn on your wok or your pan whatever it is you have and then just add this in so it doesn't have to add any oil because just now when you blend you already add oil so it doesn't have to add any oil and this one just keep later you just rinse it and add on into the paste afterwards okay now just cook this you have to saute this until the oil separates from the paste as you can see after a few seconds the oil start to floating so this is the best time where you can add in your powder spices okay just add in and let them cook together okay let them cook together you have to cook this for at least about 20 minutes if you have more time half an hour with slow fire that will be even great at this point you can smell the amazing aroma from all the spices okay so you just have to keep stirring this as you can see the color of the paste will getting darker and darker when you cook to a certain point you will realize the paste doesn't stick anymore to the wok that means it's perfectly uh, cooking let it be a bit darker okay now can add in the water just now so our paste is getting darker and darker this is what we want we want the paste to really become really dark brown color it's time to turn off your wok and scoop your paste out so just let it cool down first before we continue before we move into finishing of the laksa we have to cook the noodle uh, strain the water okay and just can leave it one side our paste is done our noodle is done once condiment is done then we're going to finish our laksa just add this tofu in a hot oil and deep fry them I use tofu to replace the egg. I'm going to add some oyster mushroom into the hot boiling water and just blanch them. Once the mushroom is done, we can scoop it out. Uh, bean sprout. Just blanch will do. Don't let it cook too long. Doesn't want to overcook them. We want to taste the crunchy texture when we eat. It's fried perfectly fine. So we can scoop out the tofu as well. Okay, now we're going to add in our laksa paste. Normal to have... Uh, a bit oily we're going to add in about a liter of water and just let this to mix well with the water we're going to slice them up just thinly slice them and then the mushroom that we blanched just now we can just uh, shred it them it's kind of like a replacement for the chicken lah. so once it start to boil going to add tofu puff so I'm adding about five tofu puffs, one cup of coconut cream or coconut milk. Just give a good stir. So I'm using a bit of brown sugar here. Okay, so this is a beautiful Sarawak laksa soup. This is a layer of oil. This is what we want. Okay, once like this, it's considered done. Okay, so now we're going to assemble our laksa. Just add in some rice noodle here. So now we're going to add in some tofu, some mushrooms some bean sprout 
calamansi lime, some coriander leaf, some red chili, some uh, tofu puff, and then we're going to add the soup. Voila, so now you can enjoy this beautiful bowl of laksa as you wish. So this is how simple and easy you can make a vegan version of Sarawa laksa. So I hope you guys really enjoy uh, today's section with me and hope you guys are uh, if interested to find out more vegan uh, Malaysian plant-based food or Malaysian vegan uh, food and all that always welcome to my page chef Dave vegan journey so you guys will see a lot of amazing uh, Malaysian recipes okay so till then goodbye have a wonderful day bye hi everyone my name is Kelly and I'm from Kuala Lumpur Malaysia today I would like to share with you my favorite Sarawak cuisine when it comes to Sarawak food, kolok mee immediately springs into mind. In its most basic form, it's a dish of slightly curly, springy noodles tossed with seasonings of pork lard, shallot oil, soy sauce, pepper and vinegar, and then finishes off with toppings of char siu, which is barbecue pork, ground pork, fried shallot, and green onion. The second dish that comes to mind is Sarawak laksa. It is indeed a very comforting dish, um, especially on a cold rainy day. The jet lag warriors had the opportunity to sample some Sarawak food while staying in their apartment in Malaysia. Here's what they think. So this one is the Sarawak laksa. Let me see. Okay. I mean, it looks yummy. You got like a it's just fish soup. fried egg, some chicken meat, uh, a lime, lime, and. Shrimp, shrimp or prawn what i would call rice noodle rice noodle with bean sprouts yeah and some green guys on Lantro. top anyway without further ado uh let's start with sarah Rock laksa okay so dun, 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 dun. are you nervous Yvonne? are you nervous on my behalf okay I am. first question spoon or fork what's my strategy i'm gonna do it wrong and they're all gonna hate me in the comments learn how to eat man um let's do broth first <laughs> let's do broth first okay um again the broth looks like it's rich in coconut milk and it has like kind of like sambal red base. Wow, Ivana. What? It tastes like curry or like tastes like rendang. Okay, so Sarah. It's so good. This is already gonna be a good meal. Oh, all my nervousness washed away. I'm wondering if Sarawak laksa has fish base then. I think it doesn't all taste like laksa it. has fish. It doesn't taste like it. It's a bit spicy. It's kind of curry like. I mean, you can see the orange uh, oil dots in there. Right. Mm -hmm. Delicious. Mm -hmm. Two for two. Let's yes. Go for this one, Ivana. This is called kolok. Kolok. Me kolok. Uh, beef. Yeah, this one is with beef. Mm, with sambal. Mix it. And it comes with this kua. Now, in my head, I would pour the soup into the bowl of noodles. Is this wrong? Uh, I think it's up to you. I like it separate. Okay. I like my noodle dry. I don't like wet noodles. You're a dry noodle kind of girl. Mmm. Mmm. This is really nice. I think out of all these three meals, mm. right now Mikolok is my favorite. It's really good. Really? Mm -hmm. So good. Mmm. Hi all, my name is Lynn. Um, I'm from Sarawak. So whenever I think of Sarawak, dishes in Sar for, that comes from Sarawak, I can think of um, Sarawak laksa and kolomi and the fishy smell because a lot of the Sarawak dishes are mainly uh, like seafood, prawns. <laughs> Tomato kwetiao is a tomato sauce based rice noodle dish which intrigued me because of its use of ketchup. I decided to have a go at making it in my kitchen here in Sydney. So I'm going to have a go at making a Sarawak tomato kwetiao. No one wants to eat some noodles. Uh, I've never tried it myself but it uses tomato ketchup. No one loves ketchup and uh, the recipe itself is not too different to the uh, kwetiao serum which is a noodle, uh, fried rice noodle dish with uh, sauce over it. Okay, so it's got ketchup in it. So let's have a go. 
Okay, so I've got some ingredients here. First of all, the noodles. Okay, this is what they call kwe tiao in Malaysia. But unfortunately, I couldn't get the wide cut noodles here in Australia. You can buy these at your Asian grocery store and usually they're cut uh, narrow or wide. So these are cut narrow. So we're going to use that and some Chinese greens and typically uh, it seems based on my research that they use choy sum. This is not choy sum, this is what we call gai lan or uh, Chinese broccoli. Okay, but it shouldn't matter too much. Uh, now, uh, you can use other types of noodles. You can use uh, egg noodles and deep fry them, okay, to make it a crispy noodle dish. Uh, but if you're using kui tiao, you would uh, want to actually pan fry the kui tiao first with uh, some soy, okay? And based on my research, a lot of people seem to use kicap manis, which is sweet soy sauce. I'm going to use a uh, thick soy sauce, which is kicap uh, bukka, which is similar to kicap manis, but darker and less sweet, okay? The reason I'm using this is because this thing is going to have a fair bit of tomato ketchup in it. And, uh, the ketchup is sweet, and I didn't want to overwhelm this dish with too much sweetness, okay? Another thing we're using is some oyster sauce. Uh, and I'm going to throw in some chicken powder and also uh, some cornstarch as well to thicken up the sauce. Okay, so let's have a go at this. So cornstarch and some pepper. Sarawak pepper, ideally if you have Sarawak pepper, since you are actually, we are actually cooking something from Sarawak. Sarawak pepper is among the best pepper in the world. Okay, so just heating this up. I'm going to add a little bit of oil to this. If you're using a wok, and a high pressure burner, this will be a lot faster, okay? You'll be able to just flash fry the noodles and scorch it, but we're just using a dinky little camping stove here, so it may be a little bit of a struggle. Oh, we need some garlic as well, okay? So we've got some fresh garlic on the side, minced fresh garlic. I'm gonna get it hot enough so that it starts smoking a little bit, so that it sizzles. In some parts of the world, kicap manis is more readily available. You see, this is uh, thicker. You see how long it's taking to pour out. Okay. Okay. Garlic. I like a fair bit of garlic. And I'm going to add the protein, which is some prawns that are peeled, and some fish cakes, alright, or fish balls that are sliced up. And I've got some chicken as well. This is just a poached chicken leg. And now you can add water or you can add chicken stock. I do have some chicken stock, so I'm just going to go and grab some of that, okay? In goes everything else to make the sauce. Bit of oyster sauce, bit of pepper, bit of chicken powder, or you can use salt if you want, and copious amounts of ketchup, okay? and or tomato paste. Also, oops, forgot about the vegetables. The, because of the type of vegetables I'm using, which is gai lan, um, I'm going to cook it a little bit longer. Usually Chinese greens uh, don't need that much cooking, okay? But gai lan tend to have pretty tough stems. So we're just gonna cook it a little bit longer than I otherwise would. Let's add a bit more water. I'm just going to cover this quickly. Just adding a bit more chicken stock here. And we're going to prepare some cornstarch or tapioca starch here. This is just to act as a thickener. We're going to add some cold water to the cornstarch or tapioca starch in my case. Cornstarch will make your uh, sauce a bit foggy in colour again. Okay, okay. I'm going to just give this a stir before you add it in because it tends to settle pretty quickly. Okay, just 
soon as the vegetables are done and the protein obviously get this done so let's put that in the middle let's serve this up I'm Charmaine and I'm from Sarawak so when I'm away from home the food that I can think about is our cake lapis of course uh, we have variety of color variety of flavor and variety of layers of course we are known for layers I also think about Dabai our Sarawak laksa our mikolog and uh, umai umai is my favorite umai we cut it like a very thin fresh fish and we mix it with calamansi lemon juice we mix it with onion and chili and the next one is ayam panso ayam panso is a traditional e bandage what ayam panso is basically uh, we stuff a chicken uh, lemongrass tapioca leaf into a bamboo before we cook it over an open fire that is all of the food that i can think about of course there is a lot more so yeah you guys should try sarawak dish because it's very nice and you won't regret it i love sarawak My fellow Australian, Emma Simons, visited Sarawak some time ago and managed to travel to a long house to experience the food and the culture. Let's take a look. So this is the umai, which is cut really thinly. It has got little bones in it, but apparently because of the precision of the guy that's cutting it, I actually won't be able to taste them. And when I get home after, I'll be mixing it with limes, onions and chilli. Can't wait to try it when I get home. Hi everyone, I'm Meryl from Kuching, Sarawak. When I think of Sarawak, I think of food like kolomi, kue chak, tomato, kue tiao, midin, buah dabai, and lots of other seafood. Kade Kame, which means my shop in Sarawak, is based in Kuching and it's famous for its laksa Sarawak. One of its team members, Amir, talks about what makes Laksa Sarawak so unique. Nama kami Amin. Uh, I'm from Miri, Sarawak. Kami daripada kedai kami salah seorang yang antara sidak yang mula-mula set up kedai kami. Selalunya orang dengar Laksa Sarawak, dia dengar-dengar tapi dia tahu kedai ni rupa Laksa Sarawak, kedai ni rasa Laksa Sarawak. Jadi bila dia pergi ke Sarawak, dia cuba Laksa Sarawak, dia selalu pada eh Ini bukan laksa. Sebab apa? Beza laksa Sarawak dengan laksa lain yang paling utama sekali lah. Nombor satu, laksa Sarawak makin mihun. Uh, rempah yang selalu dipakai untuk mula laksa Sarawak tu kebanyakannya rempah rempah ratus. Tuk susah kami nak mandah rempah apa yang dipakai sebab ni nama laksa Sarawak. Tapi kita pergi ke Sarawak, ni ada perbezaan laksa Sarawak orang Melayu, laksa Sarawak orang Cina. 
Jadi uh, rempah yang dipakai pun ada sedikit berbeza untuk laksa Cina, laksa sawo Cina yang lebih kepada belacan dan santan. I wouldn't say one is better than the other because certain people, even kami, hari itu kami mungkin rasa nak makan laksa sawo Melayu. Esok kami rasa nak makan laksa sawo Cina. Uh, for me lah, what makes a good laksa sawo is uh, when you cannot identify what's in the laksa, what's in the kuah. Uh, why I say that? Because dalam laksa sawak tu kita ada makan santan, kita ada makan rempah macam-macam rempah. Jadi uh, laksa sawak tu bila nak dimasak, it takes a long time for you to actually cook the laksa. So if certain people uh, bunyi nasi bagus lah, tapi munya macam nak bergaut nak mula laksa too fast, they make it too fast, then the, the ingredients don't blend together yet. So bila kita makannya, you can oh this is santan, this is rempah ni, this rempah ni. That's when you know that they did not really make it properly because they did not take the time to to boil it as long as it should. They did not take the time to tumis benar-benar supaya minyaknya angkat. So bila kita makan, kita sih tahu apa dalam tu dipakainya. That's when you know that it's good laksa. Hi guys, I'm Rosmina. I'm currently in Shalam. But I am originally from Sarawak. Talking about delicacies, when I think of Sarawak, um, of course, number one is laksa Sarawak. It's kind of like curry noodles with vermicelli, but it has got this special spicy taste. Then number two is nikolo, of course. It's quite similar to wonton noodles in West Malaysia. Last but not least would be rojak sotong, kangkong, and I must have it together with air jagung. Now, the sauce of the rojak is a bit different than what we can find here in West Malaysia. And the air jagung is basically shaved ice with corn, milk and syrup. Very yummy! Our MOMC chefs Rene Jufri and Bob Adnan answer the question, What dishes do you think of when you think of Sarawak? Rene Johari here. So today I would like to share with you my favorites if I think of Sarawak. So I've traveled to Sarawak, tried many dishes in Sarawak, but I would say these are the list that I would like to share with you of my favorites. So list number one will be Laksa Sarawak. So I would say everyone who traveled to Sarawak or remind yourself of Sarawak for sure, this is uh, the top of uh, everyone's list. Okay, second will be Mi Kolo. So Mi Kolo is one of uh, local favorite that must have then on my third favorite list will be umai okay umai is quite interesting it's a very refreshing dish uh, they use local fresh ingredients what's available during the season and a must try then not forgetting my favorite ingredient or condiment or it, the locals would say a dish anyway it's called buah dabai uh, dabai is quite interesting it's uh, a wild fruit the size of a date uh, very seasonal when it comes to a season, everyone will rush to the market and get the fresh, fresh dabai and uh, have it with their rice, have it with, uh, even some have it with bread or noodle. So, a must-have dabai. Uh, last but not least on the list will be sayo midin. Uh, sayo midin is a wild fern that is very common if you fly to Sarawak or you travel to Sarawak or if you tried uh, a dish from Sarawak. So, it's a must-have dish. So enjoy this uh, list of mine and enjoy travel to Sarawak. Hi guys, it's me, Chef Bob, uh, again. <laughs> All right, we're talking about uh, Sarawak food. Uh, I was working in Sarawak before, uh, about, about six months to eight months, I've uh, been traveled uh, over there. So I would uh, I like uh, to have uh, Sarawak food. This is one of, definitely in my mind, is a laksa Sarawak. There are two places that always be there. Uh, for having the laksa Sarawak first at the uh, in town of Sarawak they call it Teresa Laksa Sarawak they have a very short corner of cafe in front of uh, Hilton Sarawak over there uh, they have one corner uh, and another one is under Mama's Cafe which is very Mam Mama Cafe or Mom's Cafe something like that which is very very nice serve the laksa uh, Sarawak and another one is uh, uh, Mi Kolo definitely they have very uh, lots of uh, uh, style of uh, mikolo. Uh, sometimes they serve together with uh, daging hitam, which is very full, full of flavor. Uh, mikolo. You can also can have it at the uh, kucing Sarawak. Uh, and then the last one is uh, uh, this is a little bit different. They call it tomato uh, 
uh, crispy mee. Uh, the taste is a little bit of a sweet and sour. It's like uh, uh, Cantonese Kung Fu Kao Chao Chinese style. Uh, but they have a seafood and then also definitely they add the tomato uh, flavor, which is also very, very nice when you go to Sarawak to have it, this type of uh, food. All right, enjoy whoever uh, go to Sarawak Bumi Kenyalang. Bye. Well, that was Sarawak and its food. Uh, clearly, there was so much more we wish we could have covered once the borders reopened. We hope to be able to go there and cover it uh, a little bit more extensively. Right. Uh, in the meantime, if you want the recipes and all our bonus content, make sure you sign up at malaysianchefs.com slash streetfoodjourneys. And I look forward to seeing you again. I'm Jackie M.